Good evening. I'm going to call the Board of Selectmen's meeting for September 25th, 2017 to order. As required by open meeting law, we are informing you that we will be video, audio taping, as well as live broadcasting in this public meeting. In addition, anyone in the audience wishing to video or audio tape must notify the chairman now. Hearing no one, please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Anyone for weekly briefing? Good evening, Amy Usowski, Conservation Administrator. I just wanted to announce that the Harwich um, Conservation Department, as well as the Conservation Trust, in conjunction with Natural Resources, is going to be having their annual coast sweep this Saturday from 9 into about 11 or 12. It's an international event um, during the one month period. Many cities, towns, um, states, and of course countries, because it's an international event, have this. And it's a chance for us to tabulate just how much garbage is on our beaches and in our, um, the parking areas near beaches. So anybody who wants to attend, you can contact our department, um, or you can just show up at the Harbor Masters parking lot um, over on over on 28 at Sacquatucket Harbor at 9 a.m. on Saturday if it is downpouring there will be a rain date of Sunday morning thank you Amy. anyone else for weekly briefing public comment and announcement thank you mr. chairman I'd just like to remind the board and members of the audience that this Sunday will be the ninth annual running of the Cranberry Harvest Half Marathon and 10K Road Races, starting and finishing in the Montemore Regional High School driveway. Uh, the 10K race, that's uh, 6.2 miles, uh, will proceed down Oak Street to Queen Anne, down Depot Road, and return to Oak Street via the Old Colony Rail Trail. Uh, the Half Marathon course uh, will start and go up Oak Street to Main Street, down to Pleasant Lake Avenue, and stay on Pleasant Lake Avenue or Route 124 all the way to Queen Anne, and then Queen Anne down Depot, down uh, Uncle Venice to Red River Beach, then up Old Wharf, Julien, be on Route 28 briefly, go start up Gorham, cross, uh, turn on onto Hoyt, then Miles, then Windermere, then down Lower County to Earl Road, to Lothrop, to the bike trail, and back to Oak Street, uh, um, yeah, back to Oak Street on the the combination of Cape Cod Rail Trail and Old Colony Rail Trail. Uh, on behalf of the race director, I'd like to thank the, the town for the various approvals and also the Little League for the use of their property. Uh, we advertise the event for the, the, the scenic nature of, of the course and what a great, uh, what an attractive town Harwich is. Uh, and for the party afterwards. But with respect to the attractiveness, let me appeal to folks if there's a vacant lot next to you or a summer residence uh, where pre no one is presently living and some careless person has littered, take a step next door and pick, pick it up so Harwitz looks better. Um, it's not sold out, so if any of you on the board or anyone else in the audience uh, wants to run, you can get a bib but uh, registration on uh, Saturday afternoon at the high school. What time does the race start? The <laughs> half marathon will start at noon, Mr. Chairman, and the uh, 6.2 mile race will start 11.30, 11.45, something like that. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and presumably the, the police will have similar uh, detours and road arrangements that they've had, that they had last year. Great. Thank you, Larry. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sounds like a, a great road race. Um, unfortunately, I'm uh, coaching baseball, so I won't be able to uh, to race in that. But uh, um, <laughs> I may not be able to make it either. But anyways, um, I'm Mike Elric from the Howitz Chamber of Commerce, and uh, we're excited and happy to announce that Cindy Williams is the new Howitz Chamber Executive Director. Uh, Cindy has devoted herself to the town of Howitz, visitors and members. She is passionate about what she does. Over the past six months, she has proven herself more than capable of managing the chamber as the interim director. 
As executive director, we are confident she will continue to work to bring value in supporting the town of Harwich visitors and our members. Congratulations, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you, and great job, Cindy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Public comment and announcement, anyone else? Consent agenda. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I move the uh, following items. A, approve the minutes from September 11, 2017, executive session. Uh, two, sep approve the minutes September 11, 2017, regular session. B, approve the recommendation of the town administrator to install a new pole and relocate an old pole on 60 Kelly Avenue per request of Verizon and Eversource Energy. C, approve request for assistance from the Caleb Chase Fund. D, confirm appointment of Jeff Jeffrey Pina as heavy equipment operator for DPW as recommended. E, confirm appointment of Daniel Moresti as heavy equipment operator for DPW as recommended. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. So next up is the annual meeting with the selectmen for the Conservation Commission and Real Estate and Open Space. Uh, Real Estate and Open Space has canceled tonight. Uh, there was an issue that came up, so they won't be before us tonight. So now that Brad's here, we're going to start with the Conservation Commission. <laughs> Good evening. Sorry I was a little late, but I, I made it after all. I'm going to run through a, a series of bullets on our annual report and uh, go through this fairly quickly and then encourage any questions you have. The first bullet is on application trends for the present year. And notice of intents and requests for determination of applicability were about the same as the previous year, but administrative reviews have increased. And Amy thinks this might be related to the fact that more people are seeking to comply to our regulations and seek the permit for minor activities as opposed to taking a shot at uh, risking a violation. Another factor might be that this application is now available online, so it's easier to get. So. The second bullet is on conservation parcels. The town has received a land grant to offset the cost of holding a conservation restriction at the Marini property on Church Street. Secondly, the town is looking to acquire potentially a near 25 acre property, the Judas Eldridge property off of Hawksness Pond, and to hold a conservation restriction for the Cornelius Pond woodlands that the Conservation Trust is seeking to purchase. Both these items would need to go before the town for Conservation Preservation Act, excuse me, Community Preservation Act funding, and the commission has supported both these properties as being a value for conservation lands. In terms of Thompson's Field, um, Amy has continued to lead an effort to thin out the north side of Thompson's Field for the purpose of reducing fire danger in conservation areas and to promote this area to restore coastal sand land habitat, a globally rare habitat that is, occurs at Thompson's Field. Also, a public discussion was held by the Commission on the Bell's Neck Cranberry Bog to consider future use of that property, which is now held by the Conservation Commission. And then thirdly, a, the native plant garden at Chatham Road, Thompson's Field, is doing quite well. It's managed by the Garden Club, and there's a lot of drought-tolerant uh, drought plants that are prospering at this spot. The third bullet is on town gardens, and there's less plots that are vacant this year than last year, and there seems to be a growing interest among gardeners to have more perennial plots, and that would mean having plots that they manage year to year, keeping the same fencing, the town would not have to till these plots. And so Amy's working with them to see if this can be uh, accomplished. Fourthly, I'd like to cover changes in personnel this past year. The Commission would like to thank Walter Diggs and John Rossetti for their service to the Commission and the town as members. I'd like to personally thank Walter Diggs as our chairman. He uh, served for many years and I served under him and really appreciate his guidance and thoughtful approach as chair. I'd like to thank Carol Giannata Tosio for her many years of service as administrative assistant and welcome Patty Zingarelli to the position. We also have a new Commission member, Paul McGuire. Do we have a new assistant? that we should talk about? <laughs> I didn't see that there, so. Sorry, I missed that notification. 
Uh, we also have a new staff person, thanks to the town, the Board of Selectmen. We have a 19-hour-a-week um, conser assistant conservation agent position, which has been filled, filled by Nicole Smith. She has um, both regulatory and land management background, and she's doing phenomenal. And just to finish on that topic, I think we all really appreciate the job that Amy does. Uh, she really covers all the bases for the Conservation Commission. She does a great job with applicants, and she's very technically sound, I think, with all the regulatory issues the Commission needs to consider. So I've worked with about 20 commissions in my day job over the years on the, on the coast of Massachusetts, and I think she's about as sharp as they get as a conservation agent. So we thank, thank you very much. And we do have two vacancies right now, so we would like to encourage all folks to consider if they have any friends or family who would like to throw their hat in the ring. We, we would like to fill those positions. So finally, for upcoming projects, the Commission needs to get together and consider the fate of the <coughs> cranberry bogs at the uh, Bell's Neck Conservation Area. Uh, this is something that the lease has, um, was basically abandoned, and so we have to consider what might be done there. We're in the process of rewriting regulations for irrigation fertilizer use in the 0 to 100 wetland buffer zone, and we'll put together proposals and, and hold hearings on this soon. The Commission will participate with the annual Coast Sweep Cleanup again on September 30th. This is done every year, and it does a great job at getting <coughs> trash off of our coastal areas. And then we'll continue to maintain trails and, and work to improve access. A lot has happened with this in recent years at Conservation Lands, and we'll continue to work there. And then one final bolt that's coming up is um, we're hoping to work to establish oyster reefs in Herring River. And the idea is to introduce habitat that can help improve this important natural resource. We have a couple concepts we're considering, and we work with the Natural Resource Department to make this happen, hopefully, in the coming year. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Brad. Larry? <coughs> Thank you, Brad. Good report. Uh, Amy's going to hate me for this, so I'll probably be in trouble afterwards. But we had a... Uh, uh, a legal team, a legal team come in and, and comment on, go through the various suits going on. And at the end of that, uh, she uh, told us that Amy does the best job of writing the conditions of anyone on the Cape. Makes her job a lot easier. And to back up what you said, and uh, I don't want Amy to get a big head, but she's, you know, doing a, uh, <laughs> doing a fan fantastic job. Uh, my hat's uh, off to uh, Walter Diggs. I think he set the uh, stage for this, and then Brad's carried it on. But conservation is planning. You know, regulatory committees can all get a little uh, tense a few times. And uh, they do a great job of uh, uh, showing respect to the people that's there, ex very carefully explaining the regulations to them, what they can or can't do. And so it's always... Uh, held with dignity and, it, and the result they may not like, but in a uh, positive way. So my hat's off to you. It's not easy to do that. Thank you. I agree. Julie? Oh, I think, you know, conservation does a great job, and congrats to you guys. It's not an, it's not an easy subject matter, I, I know, so good job. Thank you. Janelle? I don't have any questions, but I'm curious, um, would these oyster beds be at the mouth of Herring River or further in or all along? Probably further upstream to avoid um, predators of oysters that seem to flourish in the more salty tidal areas. So a little further up, maybe between the bridges. Mm -hmm. There are native oysters in that whole area presently. They used to be really abundant north of 28, and they have faded away. I'm not sure why. But if we can introduce some habitat, maybe the native oysters will help seed that, and we can put some seed from culture purposes, and then just see if we can boost the, the resource in the river. And would those um, beds be um, leased to shell fishermen, or is it just simply as a conservation measure to introduce a new species to that habitat? It wouldn't be new. I mean, they are, they are present. Are and that, but I think it would be more to augment what's there, mm -hmm. because basically it's tough to get at oysters that are in deeper waters of the Herring River. And so I think we'd put these in places where it would be kind of tough to fish on, mm -hmm. so they could <coughs> send out seed and augment the natural resource. But it's going to be open for discussion. You know, we'll yeah, talk about it. Early, yeah. Heinz Prof will be involved in this as well. And it, it could be something that eventually they, they can be harvested. The towns of Dennis and Yarmouth have done something similar. Wellfleet has. So I think we'll try to learn from them and pick up their techniques. 
Don? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I join the rest of the board members in admiring the, the work in the CONSCOM. Uh, I do have uh, one question. Uh, it's kind of important. It was in your report. Uh, I was wondering if you had any idea about the timeline for the Bell's Neck uh, bogs because no decision actually essentially becomes a decision in this area. You, the bog degenerates and you can't resuscitate it. Right. We, we did discuss it recently and I think um, we haven't really had any hard decisions or, or proposals as to what to do, but I think we all realize that it's something that needs to be decided fairly soon so the bog doesn't alter too much before a decision is made. So I, I would say the discussion is going to happen soon. Yeah. We, we've been hoping for some formal options to have a constructive discussion on this. Yeah. Um, sorry, let me gather my thoughts here for a second. Um, so we're going to have a discussion a little bit later on on the agenda about the Bell's Neck Bogs, but um, like, as Brad said, the commission knows that it is um, a race against time, essentially, um, because your options will dwindle as to what you can do if you wait too much longer. Some of the bog area may not be able to be farmed, but some of it still can be. So what the commission is looking for is some guidance about what that property could be in various in various states. If it was allowed to naturalize completely, what would it look like? Um, I mean, I've done some sampling out there and have a pretty good idea of what it would turn into um, in various parts of the bog due to the hydrology. But, and then is it worth trying to go for a full-blown type restoration um, in terms of wetland restoration? Or is it beneficial to have it, com have it be a productive leased cranberry bog with a grower who would um, work very well with the commission, especially to keep the herring out. Or maybe it's a combination of a couple of things. So these are all options the commission wants to weigh and I think would welcome feedback on that. Unfortunately, studies um, in cost a fair bit of money in order to, to vet everything. So we're looking to use as much in-house and pre-advice that people have as possible as well. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I know we got it on later, and I, all I asked was if you had a timeline. <laughs> Sorry, no, we don't, but we, we realize it needs to be decided soon. Thank you for the explanation. <clears throat> I would mirror the rest of the board's comments. Um, Walter Diggs, especially, uh, watched him very closely, great guy, did a great job for the town. I would also say that Amy's position as a, a regulatory person, conservation regulatory person, I've had more comments about how fair and impartial she is um, since she started than, than, than I would ever expect. So great job, Amy. Uh, Michael, I have just one other question, if I may. Sure. Uh, the artificial reef, mm -hmm. how's that been this summer? Everyone's catching big fish there, or do you have a... Uh, I'm getting really good feedback from people I know that fish there. It's... Um, it's a case where it doesn't always have fish. They come and they go. But I've had a lot of people really excited about going out there, particularly novice fishermen who get out there and catch fish and, and have a great time. Um, there's, there's a few activities. I think, you know, we had a, a benefit last year that, mm -hmm. that generated $6,400. And that money has not been expended yet. The idea was to use it either to start education projects at the high school or to get material to add to the reef. And both those options are open. The, the money is held by, you know, your board as a trust, and so that's still active. And, uh, you know, I, I think my agency, I work for the Division of Marine Fisheries, would like to find ways to add more material to it. It's, it's a 10-year permit, I believe, with, mm -hmm. what, seven years left? Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to take advantage of that open permit to, to add more material. Some of the charter and party boat captains say it's a great spot. It could be bigger yeah. to accommodate more boats using it. So I think that speaks to getting more material on it. But I, I've had some people that have had just a great experience going out and having their kids catch their first fish, you know, their first keeper. So it's been working pretty well. So I have to, I have to put in a plug. <laughs> if the tech school does so happen to be voted <laughs> to be demoed. You want it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I want it. <laughs> um, just like Mon um, Harwich High School, the, if the basement uh, or any parts of the tech are found, to be suitable materials for the reef. I don't think we would say no. We have an old dam already stockpiled from Falmouth. They actually brought it here to us. Um, and 
just uh, as of a couple months ago, if people haven't already seen it, you can go onto YouTube and just search Harwich Artificial Reef. There's about five videos, and the, mo and the newest one is about um, three, four months old now, and you, can, you can't even tell what it, that it used to be concrete there. There's so much, uh, so much life on the reef. So I encourage yeah. you to look at that if you haven't. So I was going to ask before you said about the tech school about um, last year, Brian Wittegren had brought up the, the idea of calling it Rough Rider Reef because yeah. it was the old Harwich High School. But I don't know that it's fitting anymore. But I liked that name, and I wondered if that had ever been discussed beyond him saying it at the meeting last year that we were all at. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think formally no. it has. I, I know people are kind of calling it the High School Reef. They are. That's what people are just casually calling it. Yeah. And, uh, um, that is, I've sent e a couple of emails off to USGS, who is in charge of those designations. Mm -hmm. um, it was a while ago. I don't think I ever heard back, but I can always revisit that. Great. And just briefly, moving to the town of Yarmouth, we designed a reef pyramid mold that we made out of custom aluminum, again with my day job, and we gave this to the Cape Cod Salties. And they're pouring concrete, these reef pyramids, mm -hmm. to add to the Yarmouth Tire Reef. And so that's an option that could happen here in Harwich as well. We would build this reef mold and then add to it. We, well, the, in this case, maybe the students could make it, mm -hmm. but it's also would have to you know, clear all those channels. The, the Cape Cod Salty said, yeah, bring it to us and we'll use it. So mm -hmm. that's happening right now in Yarmouth. It could happen here. But probably to add the most material, it would take more of a coordinated type of grant project that brought a big a large amount out with a barge at once. Mm -hmm. But that's a small scale grassroots project that's happening in Yarmouth now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as I mentioned, real estate and open space has canceled for tonight. So next up, town administrator and the finance director to present the five year financial plan and update on FY 16 and 17 audit. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna invite Carol up just to kind of fill in some voids if I uh, miss something. Uh, Carol did a uh, considerable amount of work on the uh, project, so I want to make sure she gets uh, due credit. And then she is responsible for the audit, so she can give you a much better update than I can on the uh, status of the audits. So uh, the financial plan, we did keep kind of a similar model to what the, what the community has seen in the past. So I'm going to run through, if we can have the uh, first slide. As you can see, what we uh, usually take on first is uh, what is the sources, what, where, where do we get our money from, and what are the assumptions made. So on uh, property tax, we, we do have in there to use, utilize the property tax, a statutory increase of 2.5. We have a, a set amount for growth. We usually uh, exceed that 200000 but for planning purposes, we put in there the 200000 uh, Capital exclusion, the only thing that if we've had anything that's been approved in the past, then we would put that in. Uh, we do not have anything specifically in there going forward. Uh, capital exclusion, just for folks, uh, I know I had a, uh, a question come up uh, from one of the, the YouTube videos that we post about the different exclusions. Uh, so a capital exclusion is usually it's done for uh, vehicles. It's a one-time, one-year uh, increase on the uh, taxes to pay for a, a vehicle or, or something of that nature. The, um, the debt and the capital exclusion is obviously uh, voted separately above and beyond Proposition 2.5. Uh, the debt, we have the, the debt schedule, so the debt schedule that, you, that we've adopted, uh, and you'll see in the, in the last slide here uh, where the debt is for the existing debt and the proposed debt. Uh, general override is when you do a uh, permanent increase uh, to the Prop 2.5 uh, debt limit, uh, Prop 2.5 taxation limit. Uh, we do not, uh, in, in my time here, we have not recommended uh, general overrides. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we do not, uh, going out, uh, recommend them either. On overlay surplus, uh, there's usually some uh, excess revenue as we put money aside for people that ask for abatements on taxes, and we usually have a little bit left. Uh, that's something, obviously, we have to estimate what we anticipate people are going to put in for. Uh, also, the next one, Community Preservation Act. And one of the things that we have done uh, in this uh, plan specifically, and we have done this in the past, but uh, for town meeting purposes, I think last year's town meeting was the first year we did it. And we try to segment off, off all the uh, community preservation articles so they're all grouped together so we have a, a separate bucket. Uh, community preservation, ironically, they get more money than we do to run the whole town uh, just as a process of uh, how that works. 
so they, they get a fair amount that's uh, given to them uh, through the through the uh, acceptance process and they obviously use it for the intended purposes uh, we do however have a, uh, a debt obligation in, in the land bank so that is something that we do have to fund so that's why you see it here uh, that will be paid in full in 2024 uh, and then as I had alluded to the provision for uh, abatement and exemption of uh, property tax so we have a uh, an allocation in for that uh, state aid uh, we have a number in for state aid uh, it's kind of interesting that what the state take you know what the state gives the state takes away so our assessment uh, versus the amount of state aid we get generally offset each other they're usually within about ten thousand dollars of each other uh, so that that's something that is in there uh, msba reimbursement we had a uh, an old reimbursement that ended last year uh, one of the things you'll see when we uh, show you the debt chart is the debt went down by a million dollars and the revenue was at a million and the debt was at a million dollars because it was a project and both got paid off so we got our we received our last reimbursement in 17 so you'll see that as being uh, kind of in there uh, uh, kind of a healthy jump up uh, state assessments uh, we anticipate 2.5 percent increase these are kind of driven by the uh, the state law too that under prop two and a half uh, we can only go up two and a half that means the state assessments are supposed to also only go up by two and a half percent on uh, motor vehicle excise uh, carol's actually introduced and i, I fully agree with this a uh, weighted three-year average so in the past what we've done is kind of looked at the uh, the re revenue that we received from these categories and put them in and then made adjustments uh, down by uh, 10 percent the board does have a policy that we're not supposed to estimate right at the maximum we're supposed to estimate about 90 percent so we have uh, captured that in the uh, revenue projections here. Uh, we just, we, we, I don't think we necessarily did a full weighted average in the past. We've introduced a weighted average this year. Uh, the same holds for uh, other local receipts. Uh, just in um, looking at the local receipts, uh, the main areas where we have uh, fairly significant uh, revenue sources is on the uh, municipal solid waste and then on ambulance fees are, are two areas. Uh, that we have uh, motor vehicle excise we have separated off here but that is a, uh, a category too uh, CVEC we have the uh, the CVEC uh, number uh, in there and the uh, motel and hotel tax with the weighted average and the meals tax and then cable we do have under the cable agreement uh, with the franchise agreement we do get a uh, percentage of their revenue so we have looked at that uh, component I do think that uh, as we go forward and as technology changes, that's something that we really want to carefully monitor. Uh, I think less and less people will use uh, the cable providers and will go through um, on the internet to, to get their uh, entertainment from. And that will have a negative effect on that revenue stream for us as we move forward. So we, we have the sources, uh, basically the revenue stream, uh, and then we go to the uses side and on this page we have uh, the operating expenses on the town side budget we do salary and wages uh, we have negotiated quite a few contracts at the two percent we put in there 2.25 uh, that is to cover steps that people have uh, in, in there so we have to have some allocation for that and so we have that additional quarter percent to cover some of those costs on uh, Medicare we take the uh, total salary and wages and uh, that's under state law 1.45 percent so we match that as the enrollments and change in the workforce we have to adjust to those uh, changes a uh, general expense that kind of covers uh, the electric and, and other costs that we have uh, gas uh, natural gas so we have a, a weighted three-year average and a three percent uh, for 19 and then 1.5 here on uh, solid waste uh, we will look at that based upon the tipping fees uh, increase and then certainly that's something we have to look at in terms of the uh, the, the amount that we get in uh, unemployment unemployment is broken into two pieces uh, twenty thousand dollars for uh, basically town-wide uh, golf because they hire so many people tend to have a, uh, a larger uh, unemployment so they do budget for that separately uh, legal we have been trying to ramp up legal slowly uh, to build that up uh, to get to hopefully a point where we're able to control legal costs and uh, uh, also increase that budget to get to a, uh, a break-even point next 
On the uh, uses side, uh, you could see uh, some of the ones that we've had in the past that have been uh, fairly uh, high increases. Uh, group health insurance. Uh, I do sit on the Cape Cod Municipal Health Group, and I, I wish there was uh, more positive results to report. Uh, I do think that uh, based upon this year's financial uh, results, they have had, uh, his, well, I don't know, historically, at least the last 10 years, where they have a range that they keep in reserves between 8 and 12 percent. We've always been in excess of that 12 percent over that 10-year period. Uh, last year, we got down into about the 10 percent range. This year, 8 percent. So we're at the bottom of the, uh, the safety range, if you would, for reserves. So anywhere between 8 and 12. Uh, when they were above 12, they used that to supplement the rates to, to kind of give a, something back to the cities and towns. And now that we're down to the 8% range, uh, that is going to really kind of hinder our ability to offset uh, some of those rate increases. So we, we did, for planning purposes in here, we put in 15%. Uh, I think last year we started off at 12%, so a little bit higher. Uh, one of the things, obviously, with the, um, and, and we are monitoring it, it's really the first year. Uh, in July 1st, uh, the Cape Cod Municipal Health Group rolled out uh, the high deductible plans. And the more people that use that, uh, I think that that will be a, uh, an item that has the opportunity uh, to have some cost containment. There is benefit to the employees, too, because if you don't use it, that's money that you get to keep. So the employee gets to keep. On uh, OPEB funding, uh, we do have here, what I'd like to do is to introduce the concept this year. We have historically in the health insurance budget put in a specific line item for $100,000. Uh, and then health insurance, because we have to estimate if we're off uh, at all, uh, it, then we have some surplus in there. So I'd like to kind of introduce the concept this year of in the health insurance budget, uh, go up from instead of 100000 up to 300000 uh, what that will do is if we do have a year in which we, we budget 12%, but the revenue, um, the expenses actually come in less than that, then we would have more money to put into the OPEB. So I, I think it's a, a, a better approach to take to this uh, to give us the opportunity to add additional. We have separated that off just to kind of show that uh, for planning purposes here. Uh, so it's not necessarily a $200,000 increase. It's just a, a better way to allocate our health insurance dollars. So if we have the money, instead of just doing 100, we can go up to 300,000. On uh, the pensions, Barnstable County, uh, everyone that's down here has a uh, and it gets an assessment. That assessment is 5.28%. Uh, the, they anticipate fully funding of the system in 2036. So the 5.28 sounds like a lot. Uh, they did not make enough money on employees that uh, earlier in the system. So if they were a 5 percenter, sometimes people would call the 5 percenter, the amount of money that the, the system needs to generate is above and beyond what the contributions are. Uh, folks like I, myself, uh, 8 and 2 or 9 and 2 percent, uh, 9 percent of the first 30,000 you make and then 2 percent surcharge on top of that. So it's probably about 10.5% people pay. Uh, for most employees, they cover their own expense. So this is really just funding the schedule uh, to be able to have a fully funded uh, liability by 2036. So that's why that 5.25, 5.28 is a little higher than you would normally see because we are pre-funding a uh, obligation. The only exception to that rule, uh, there's probably a few exceptions, but the two main ones, police and fire, uh, because they're allowed to retire early and the length of service they have, they don't generally pay for themselves, so there is a subsidy that the taxpayers have. But essentially, most of the other employees pay for their own retirement. And I don't know if uh, people in the community really understand that, that they think it's a lucrative benefit. Uh, it is a lucrative benefit, but it's paid for by the employees. So that, that is uh, the, the pension system for... Uh, the Barnstable County. And that's not just Barnstable County, that's actually statewide that that occurs. <coughs> On the uh, property and liability insurance, uh, we do have 3% in there. We've actually done fairly well with some of the percentages on the, um, on the property and liability insurance. Our, our uh, risk factors uh, have been reduced as we do a lot of safety. Uh, the, the trouble is, is that you always have uh, what they call an increase in value. 
So if you have uh, new equipment that comes on board or if you put a new building on board, uh, that increases the amount uh, that they have to cover. So it's not just covering for the rate increases, it's also covering for the expansion of risk uh, by the uh, introduction of new uh, buildings or equipment. The debt, as you can see, is um <coughs> pretty much modeled on exactly what we have for uh, existing debt. Uh, and then you'll see in some of the, in the later slide uh, that we have also in there the projection for authorized and unissued debt. Uh, one of the things that we did with uh, Hilltop Security, they ran a debt analysis for uh, what, what the town's current debt is. And we also got in there uh, Cape Tech, uh, that debt, and then the uh, sewer project, the 40 years. So we have some of the uh, elements of that. And you'll see in a, a later slide that I think Carol's done a, a nice job working with them to keep that debt fairly level. I know one of the things I've had since I've been here is you don't want to have peaks and valleys in your debt that tends to uh, drive your tax rate and tax rate a little bit crazy. By having some stability in that, it, it makes more sense. <coughs> As alluded, the uh, state and county assessment, the 2.5, uh, is factored in there. On uh, Cape Cod Technical High School, uh, we have in there a zero increase in students. Uh, we did have a year in which we had no increase in students. Their overall enrollment went down, and our percentage increase was 3.25. So even though they kept their uh, budget increase that year at zero, the fact of losing two kids and having the enrollment, uh, I'm sorry, keeping our enrollment the same, but having overall the system lose, we actually had an assessment of 3.25. So some of these things have factors that are uh, really enrollment driven. So obviously that 3.25 will change if we have more students going into that school, uh, then our assessment will increase. It's, it's strictly a uh, percentage of the number of people. And then here we do have, uh, this is a, a new addition, the, um, the, the debt service for the, the new, uh, hopefully the new Cape Cod Technical High School uh, project. So we have in there factored in uh, on the assessment. We do have right now our enrollment number is 12.4%. Uh, total project cost is just shy of uh, $128 million. So we, we do have that debt service included in, the, uh, in this plan. On the uh, Monomoy uh, operating, we uh, increase 3.25%. The one thing about a uh, education system is they have, not only do they have steps, but they have lanes. So for us, uh, a typical employee will migrate through where we do a uh, cost of living adjustment and then based upon their longevity, they're eligible for step increases. In a school system, they have uh, that plus they have if somebody goes and goes from getting a, uh, a bachelor's degree to a master's degree, uh, they get additional compensation. So they, they have a, a tendency to, to have a little greater uh, increase in their percentage overall than what you would see on the um, on the town side. Uh, the capital budget, uh, we have uh, budgeted that um, as, as zero. We do that as part of the overall assessment. On the uh, middle school debt, there was a small amount of debt that was within Proposition 2.5, and, uh, and this is uh, coming off, actually 2019 will be the last year of that, and then the payments are done. Uh, so that is, and that is the net of the uh, school building assistance. And then we have also in there as a closeout item, there is still a $1.5 million ban. Uh, they are still in the process of closing out the uh, project, so there is a little bit of money that they've rolled over. They have not yet permanently financed that, so when they permanently finance that, that will have to be included into the, um, into the debt service. Overall, the, the, the big dollar one, the, the large, was financed for 25 years and at a just over 3% uh, interest rate. I do appreciate, actually, I don't know if folks remember that or not, but uh, the town of Chatham, because they have a little better cash position than we do, uh, they were looking for a 20-year schedule, and I think we, were, we would have been more advantageous for a 30-year schedule to kind of offset some of those costs, and we compromised at 25, but that did have a a positive impact on our overall uh, debt, situa debt situation. And then I think this one is, uh, they have estimated a uh, roof project of 1.9 million in 2022. 
uh, to do some work on one of the schools. The next chart basically takes the, uh, the existing numbers uh, that we have and kind of lays them out. And you can see the, uh, the current budget year that we're in. Uh, we have 61 million for sources, uh, 60 million, 980, 989. So we're about 100,000 uh, to the good, if you would. Uh, sometimes that happens. Uh, simply we plan for a certain amount for um, new growth and when the actual new growth number comes in. So it's not unusual to have a little bit of a, uh, obviously we want to leave a little bit of a surplus uh, in the budget. For the outgoing years, uh, one of the things that I know we had a, a issue a couple years ago uh, in which we had uh, an issue with the tax rate and you know I had indicated at the time that by increasing uh, some of our, uh, re not reserves, uh, some of our local receipts that what that did was it gave us the ability to create about uh, $600,000 worth of excess levy capacity in the um, in the property tax and we plan to use that over two years. So you can see that uh, that would be in 18 and 19 that we have allocated those monies into this plan and what that shows, I mean obviously on a, a $64 million budget for next year, uh, we have it basically, it's, it's balanced at $50,000 surplus. You know, quite honestly anything around 100,000 or less is you know, it's, it's almost a rounding when you get to $64 million. But um, so we, we do have for 19, assuming that these uh, trends that we just laid out, uh, we do have the ability to have a, a balanced budget for 19 and that actually does translate into uh, 20 as well. It's not at all unusual, I've been doing this for a long time and I think uh, every single time I've done one of these charts in years three through five, uh, you tend to get where that separation, that 15% on health insurance tends to catch up with you. Uh, the reality is like on the 15% for health insurance this past year, I think it averaged out to be probably about 9% because some of the plans went at eight, some of the plans went at 10, or no, yeah, eight, and then some one plan went at 12%, but that blended out to 10. So if we carry 12 or 15 and it comes in actually at 10, then that helps to make those adjustments. So there are sometimes uh, pretty good, uh, pretty, you know, good size adjustments that occur uh, within the existing fiscal year uh, that help to, to make that where the, I always say the more accurate numbers are really your first and second year out is where you get your best picture and the out years become more of a um, estimation in, in, the, uh, in the process, of more a product of math than in, uh, in the substance of what we're doing. I think what I'd like to do now is maybe uh, Carol uh, did a nice job on the uh, debt chart, so I'll turn it over to Carol and then she, we can uh, open it up to any questions and then she'll get into the uh, audit material. Okay. Um, so actually the, what we had included in the debt schedules were all of the projects that were had been approved thus far and that um, you hadn't sold bonds for yet. In addition to that, we took the capital plan and we incorporated the capital plan that was approved in May um, into those debt schedules as, as well. So that would include any project that is slated um, on the, um, in your plan to be bonded. Um, we didn't make any other assumptions after that, except for um, the Cape Cod Tech. We did include those and in, in the um, school district as well. Um, do you wanna go to the next? Is that where you wanna? Yeah, if you, like you want to, to just kind of highlight the chart and what the chart means. Oh, sure. <coughs> um, so this is, a, I guess, a, a, a nifty little chart that kind of shows you, you have, you have the glory of having it in color. So um, kind of shows you where the, your existing debt is for the town of Harwich um, and whether it's supported inside or outside of your proposition two and a half. Um, it, it looks at what are you proposing for debt in the future and how are you proposing it? Is it self-supporting? Um, uh, and self-supporting is a large portion of the Harbor Master projects are self-supporting. And um, that was discussed at town meeting, it was discussed in other conversations, just as, um, as well as golf operations and the debt that will be taking on for the $1.2 million project that's ongoing right now. 
A lot of that is self-supporting. So this takes that into account as well. And then we have what we call like overlapping debt. And what that means is it doesn't really belong to the town of Harwich, and it, that would be the Cape Cod Tech, but you, you have a responsibility to that debt, so we call it overlapping debt. Um, and, and just the different categories and the levels, the meaning what, what, what will the town have take on in up to 2038 in debt payments if you were to approve your entire capital plan um, that was brought forward in May in addition to the other projects in the school. Um, I do have a, just a cup, one other note to make. One of the narrative lines didn't get updated, so I don't want you to be misled by it. So if you go back to where the sources, the page is where the sources are, and at the line it says it's provision for abatement and exemption. So this caps at $480,000 where the narrative says it increases $10,000 a year. The cap is at $480,000. So I apologize for that. I think we're happy to take any questions in, in terms of... Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Carol. Don? <coughs> Janelle? No, I have no questions. Julie? Can I, can I just ask, uh, when it says uh, on... The septic loans, I'm just looking at the sources of funds and uh, septic loan. I'm just curious what that is. Yeah, we, we do have a, a few projects uh, similar to Betterments uh, oh. also where we have um, loans like that where it's really a betterment process so we have to account for the, the money that comes in. So if somebody has a betterment, which we have a ginger, ginger club ginger betterment club. is a great example of this, where we will have a um, borrowing for that money and some people have the option to pay that assessment up front all at once. Okay. Uh, so generally what we try to do is uh, if we get 50% of the people pay up front, then we'll pay down that debt. So we'll do it short term. Uh, once we go past that period of time that they have the opportunity to pay that off, there are certain people that will want to extend that out. I think on the septic loan that we learned from the county, it was a 20-year repayment schedule. So then we have to borrow the money, and then we use the, uh, the funds that we get on an annual basis from people paying that as part of their tax assessment. It, it holds almost as a, uh, a betterment towards their uh, tax obligation. So we pool that money together and use that to pay the debt service. Okay. Now, would that be something that in the future we would refer over to, to um, the in, county? In this I case, mean? I think the town did some on its own, so that's where you see the, okay. the numbers in here. Uh, if we were to do that, that's where that category would be. Certainly, I think uh, administration-wise, it would make more sense to send people to the county because the county has, I, I think I had said 1.300 million. They don't have 300 million, 30 million. Mm -hmm. So they do have sufficient funds, and it operates the same way. So they borrow the money, and then people pay them back. Right. So they have that pool of money which to draw off of. Right. And we would have to basically create that pool mm -hmm. uh, to do that. If to we do that to otherwise, do that. right. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Chris uh, or Carol, water indirect. 650 rough. What is the water indirect number? The water indirect increases every year. So this year it's 650,000 and change. Um, and then it, it increases at. Um, yeah, the, the best way to visualize it is a, um, a, a water department, when you enterprise fund something, it, it, it's not self sufficient. Uh, they don't do everything on their own. So there are certain elements that they rely upon the town. So they re in this case, they rely upon the town to obtain health insurance for them, uh, their assessment for uh, de uh, debt services is, is, is separated off. But the indirect costs are generally uh, health insurance, uh, any life insurance, any of the other uh, related things. We also do, uh, we pay their bills, so uh, all their accounts payable are done through the town. So we do, actually, it's been a little bit, uh, I, I know Larry was on initially, we did an indirect cost analysis of what those costs are, and we do an assessment. So when a, a taxpayer sees an enterprise fund is supposed to be self-sufficient, 
they do everything within the water department, but there are certain functions they can't do, like I just mentioned those ones, the ac accounts payable and, and things of that nature. We, we can level an assessment or an indirect cost allocation against them so they are self-sufficient, but those resources are actually taxpayer resources. Uh, one that we will have to put in here, just thinking about it, is the, uh, the sewer. We'll have to set up that sewer enterprise fund and figure out the mechanics of, of introducing that into the, uh, into the process. How about their um, OPEB? Do they take care of their own OPEB <coughs> or do we pay their OPEB? They do. They, they do. do. They take care of their own. We will, uh, right now, I think we get an assessment and they pay. We will uh, make sure that we get a more specific allocation. So if we have a $40 million liability and their liability for that is $4 million, then they'll be on a payment plan to pay their portion of it. Larry? <coughs> uh, remind us, Carol, on the uh, existing tax supported exempt that's uh, coming down, what, what's that debt again? What is, what is the debt? It's a, it's a blue, uh, you put yep. your chart up, it's a blue on the bottom of the chart, it's existing tax support, it's, it's Prop 2 and a half overrides that are coming down. Yep, so it is uh, coming down. That's what, the what's it, what exactly is that coming down? Which debt is it? Yeah. Um, a lot of it is the land bank debt. Um, I okay. can, I, you well, know, I'm think happy. The, the, the I don't existing need all the tax support is just one uh, debt that's exempt is the uh, Monomoy School. Okay. We, we did that. Our, you know, our portion of that was 20 Because that's actually dollars. showing a positive in terms of helping keep their overall tax relatively flat. But the negative on that is if you go to the table above it where you, in 2021, we're all of a sudden digging ourselves quite a hole. And so there's a work to, it's never too early to start thinking about moving forward because, you know, 2018 and 2021 were already uh, not, a, a lot not of that, meeting up. A lot of that is the, uh, is the <coughs> sewer debt, trying to do wastewater debt. So bringing on. So that, that will show up in, that, is that reflected in this chart? That yes, is. Yes, that's correct. Yes. <coughs> so that's the absorption of the beginning of $200 million worth of debt. Into, into this plan that goes out to 20, 2038. Bless you. But Bless you. So we haven't figured out what the sources are to pay for that exactly since it shows up in negative. Well, the recommendation and I think what the board has voted in the past is to have uh, it be done as a debt exclusion. So. Yeah, I mean, but it's, it doesn't, it's not reflected here then that, that sources, that's what you're saying. It is, it's shown, on the, it's shown on the property tax side and then on the expense side, it's shown in the debt service. Debt exclusion is an offset. So if you need a million dollars to pay the debt service, so you, you get a million. So you're revenue. saying the negative isn't real then, then looking at this chart. <coughs> it has a uh, offsetting uh, okay. funding mechanism. Don? Just a, as a postscript, Mr. Chair, <coughs> uh, <coughs> those offsets are real people paying taxes, so we got to be really careful going forward about yeah. what we can absorb. And that's what I'm trying to get across because we're talking about net here, and so still r real dollars. Yeah, it's easier to talk about it in terms of tax receipts, but it's actually somebody paying more. Yeah. Chris? I think that does equate out, though. When we did the debt service for the, the wastewater, I mean, that's still $400 to the average taxpayer. It is real money, but when you levy it over the, the 10,000 properties, it's $400. Right. So. All I was thinking about is the context <coughs> of the future and about <coughs> other things that we might like to have as opposed to we really need to have. Questions or comments from anyone in the audience? All set, Dana? Jack? Good. Excellent. Any more from the board? No. All set. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Do you want to just comment on the uh, audit? Yes. Um, <clears throat> for FY16, um, Lynch, Malloy, and Malini were the town's auditors. Um, uh, we just received a draft audit um, from them, and um, I um, reached out and asked them for the final audit report with the management letter, um, and so I expect that to be forthcoming. Um, they also conducted a single audit. So it, if you're familiar with single audits, they're required for federal expenditures, um, $750,000 or over, in excess of that. And so there was a single audit that was conducted. 
they had um, let me know that they're working on putting together that audit report, which is a separate audit report, and will let me know when that is available for you. For FY17, um, the new auditors, Powers and Sullivan, have been here. They were on site um, two different occasions. Um, right at the beginning of the August and then at the end of August. So their on-site work is complete. Um, and they're working on, you know, additional schedules in their office. Um, they um, will need to obtain an OPEB um, update. That information was sent on to Siegel Consulting uh, about six weeks ago. And so this is part of a county project. Um, and so once we receive that information, then we can finalize the audit for FY17. In addition, I believe that they'll be asking, inquiring of additional questions, such as capital assets and things of that nature, but we've sent everything to them um, that they have requested. Um, we are also doing a special study of cemetery funds for dating back from 2006 to 2017. Um, and the scope of those services um, um, require us to obtain bank statements that date back to 2006. We're having a little trouble getting those bank statements because we don't have them. So we're working with the banks that, um, were, that um, the town held those funds and to try and get these statements. Um, when I asked for an update on where we are with this um, special research project, they had said it's going to take a couple of more weeks before that is complete. Great, thank you. What was the single audit done for in six in sixteen? Muddy Creek. Muddy Creek, thank you. And then when that's done, uh, I know last year we discussed having an audit presentation, having the auditors come in and speak to the board and make the recommendations off the management report. Do you know if that's on the table for Lynch Malloy or is that Chris? Well. I I think, well, I'll just say this publicly. <laughs> Were we phasing out Lynch Malloy? I mean, I don't know how how um, how much quality we're going to get. I think that uh, um, perhaps a better approach is that when the FY17 audit is done, now we brought in Powers and Sullivan, a, um, a, a firm, obviously, we made a change based upon, we believe, higher quality, and having them come in and see what they found in looking at our books with a, uh, a fresh set of eyes, I think is, is probably gonna be a, a more valuable exercise for the board uh, to see their recommendations uh, relevant to, and, and I know we had this discussion with them, the whole idea of the CAFR, uh, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, um, you know, what are the tools that we need to have and, and need to make sure we put into place uh, to get to be a AAA rated community and what are the financial concerns that, that they have seen coming in with a fresh set of eyes. So, and just, you know, for the record, I mean, they, they have, I don't know if they have like 50, 50 different municipalities they do. I mean, they do a lot of municipalities and they've been in this, they've been in the business as long as I have. So coming up on year 28, I mean, they, they've been around a long time. So they bring a lot to the table. But I think having them come in and do an overview would probably be um, a little bit more of a valuable exercise. I'm not sure when that the 17 audit would be done and what the timing is of them potentially coming in. So, so the, they, so it'll be uh, part of the CAFR. So the CAFR contains um, information for analytical information for the past 10 years. So it's going to take a little while to put that CAFR, to, to finalize that CAFR and put it all together because that's all rolled into the audit report. Didn't we have a by December 31st? Yes. We have to submit it to, uh, uh, CAFR is, um, is typically <coughs> submitted to the Government Finance Officers Association on an annual basis and they have a review team that critiques it and reviews it. It has to be submitted by December 31st. So I, I think that will give a, a, you know, the selectmen, I think, a great look. I mean, we have not had a CAFR done. I don't know if we've ever had one done. I just, I don't know. Uh, but it hasn't been done in, in quite a while, I think it's safe to say. So that will give a, a good look at how we are doing overall. So when we submit it by December 31st, what kind of feedback do we get and how long does that take? So then, then it's just submitted for, they have an award um, that's, that's um, 
coveted by many municipalities. Um, it typically takes them, in my experience, I think it typically takes them a few months to go through that review. You can certainly submit it before December 31st. They would be happy, pleased mm -hmm. with that. Okay. But, um, but it typically does take a few months. Okay, thank you. I, I do think to the, to the point that there's, there's two things here. One is we want to make sure that the audit is done and in, in, in the auditing world we're viewed as, as a sound, uh, sound financial risk. Uh, the second piece is uh, more what Standard & Poor's, which I, Standard & Poor's are the people that actually do the, uh, the ratings. It's what are they looking for. And I think that the, the CAFR is one of the tools that Standard & Poor's relies heavily upon for the financial viability of a community. So having the CAFR done first uh, and, and kind of making our way and, and getting a, a, a thumbs up, if you would, from the uh, accounting world or auditing world is probably the first step, and then we will approach uh, doing the um, the debt service when we go out for a large debt, which I think we are getting to a point where we will be going out, and that's when we want the bond rating uh, to get the, the biggest value that we can. Thank you. I look forward to 17, but I also look forward to 16. I think Lynch, Malloy, and Marini is certainly um, not gonna give us something that's false, so I look forward to an overview on 16 as well. Maybe not a presentation, but mm -hmm. certainly want to go over the management letter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in regards to 16, uh, a young lady mentioned something about there hasn't been a management letter issued yet. And I would caution the board that if the auditors do issue you a management letter, you certainly should respond to it and have a presentation on it because that management letter will include any uh, uh, faults or things that they feel that you may want to change. And again, we're already into 17, so. Uh, I think it's only going to behoove you guys to understand how we left 16 and that, you know, you don't have to go through the whole audit, but certainly address the things that uh, the auditors point out in the management letter. If in fact they do, maybe they, maybe it'll say you're clean and there's, there's no problems, but it, certainly if there are, it, it would be, I think, a benefit to get a presentation on those issues and make sure that you're addressing them because again, 17 is already over. We're halfway through 18, so uh, just food for thought. Thank you. Anything else on this? All set? Thank you, Carol. Next up under old business is Ginger Plum Lane Betterment. Chris, do you want to just give a quick overview? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I don't think anyone's here from the assessing. Uh, at, at town meeting last year, I believe it was last year, we had uh, got a um, funding for uh, to do the Junior Club Road. This is when uh, certain people in the community, if they want to have their road improved, can approach the town. We do have a process. Uh, they wanted to have their road fixed. Uh, it is a uh, private way, but the town acts as uh, the fiduciary to, to oversee this. Uh, we also uh, made sure that we arranged to um, have the um, design be reviewed and, and the engineering department does that. At the end, when the project is all done, because it is a betterment and the, the folks know that, uh, that you have the vote that you have before you, uh, by law, we're entitled to do a, an administrative fee and to set the uh, interest rate. So in this case, the administrative fee for doing the uh, work, uh, overseeing the work was 9,376.43, and the interest rate would be 5%. Uh, the total road betterment would be 176,813 and a prorated share uh, per each uh, assessed property or a better, uh, betterment property would be 6,907. That's where I said they get a notice, they could pay that 6,907 if they want or they can finance that over a, uh, a period of time. And then the, uh, the uh, Board of Assessors uh, do the betterment assessment so there's actually a list. Uh, the significance of this and the reason for the vote being so specific is it does go on to their D onto uh, through the um, county or uh, land court and gets uh, identified with their uh, actual properties. So if they were to sell their property, then the new owner would assess or be assessed that same uh, betterment. Thank you, Chris. <coughs> Motion in the packet. Chris, do you want these individually or can we do it all as one? I think we can do them all as one. Any board members have questions on this before we go to a motion? Can I get a motion? Sure. So motion. I move that we vote an administrative fee of $9,376.43 and a 5% interest rate. 
vote for total road betterment of 167,800. 176,813. Six, six, and a prorated share of $6,907. And vote to certify the list of betterment assessments to the Board of Assessors. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the motion. As read. Any discussion? All in no. favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Next up on old business is Sacquatucket Landside pro Project Update. Chris, do you want to start this? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in terms of, I, I don't think there's been a project that has... <laughs> required more time and attention than, than this project. Uh, I, I just want to uh, commend uh, John Rendon has been a, uh, a good partner here to, to make sure that we go through. Uh, what we wanted to do was to make sure that we looked at what uh, town meeting had voted. Town meeting had voted $3 million for uh, the land side uh, project at Sacquatucket Harbor. And we wanted to, uh, to see when we've gone out to bid, the bids have come in a little bit, uh, a little bit higher than we had anticipated. So I, I took a, uh, a stab here at, at doing a memo to kind of lay out kind of where we are right now and, and the recommendation going forward. Uh, we did have, uh, and this board is aware, that we did award the waterside uh, project. So that waterside contract and the, and the work is. Uh, slated to be underway. I think they're coming in at the beginning, uh, middle of October, uh, when the boats are out of the way to, to commence work on that um, that part of the project. The land side, uh, I really broke it down to, to six components uh, to try to simplify this for folks. Uh, so the six components would be the, uh, the Harbor Master's office, uh, the boardwalk, which is a ADA boardwalk, really to give people access. Uh, the septic system, uh, which we are looking to do separately, uh, downy parking, uh, and then the maintenance garage and the snack shack. Uh, and going through what we found when we received the materials in and the bid, uh, that we had only a piece of this. So we, we have bid out, uh, if you would, the office work, uh, the Hardmaster's office, the boardwalk, and the snack shack uh, and the garage. And with those numbers uh, at the level that they came in, uh, it's, it's probably too high. So what we're looking to do is how do we uh, essentially rescope this in order to have a project and how do we have a project where I think what we're trying to do uh, administration wise in, in the Harbor Master is we'd like to have the disruption that occurs occur in one season. So we do believe if we go back out to rebid, instead of having a May completion date, we probably will have to have a, a June, end of June completion date, which keeps us out of the, the lion's share of the, the summer season, but uh, to rebid, and the recommendation here is to rebid, uh, in which we do the Harbor Master's Office and the ADA Boardwalk, uh, award that to a, a general contractor, keep the snack shack in there as an ad alternate, um, and then at the same time, but in a different bid, uh, go out again for the septic system. The septic system would have the base bid for uh, without the snack shack, the ad alternate would be with the snack shack. So we will have uh, good numbers on those pieces. That, that takes care of four out of the six components of the project. I have also recently gone down to uh, speak to Mr. Hooper, uh, DPW Director Hooper, uh, in regards to if there's something that we can do to get more cost certainty into doing a parking lot at the former Downey property. Uh, and he did, um, I think he was, uh, he and the DPW crews right across the street here at Brooks Park uh, put in a, uh, what they call a gravel or T-based parking lot uh, with some fencing that goes with that. And in conversation with Mr. Hooper, I, I just had this conversation with him last week, so I, I would like to buy him a little bit more time. Uh, we believe that he's going to be able to do that work at kind of a cost certain uh, $100,000. So we will have an element of certainty into that parking lot. It's not inconsistent with what we had said um, that if we had to make uh, concessions to the project, the, the two concessions that we would look at 
is the snack shack piece and the uh, the parking instead of having a paved surface to have a uh, a t-based surface or a, a graveled surface so under this plan that that addresses now five out of the six budget items uh, the one thing that we decided to take out and to rebid uh, separately would be the garage uh, having the garage as a phase two uh, makes some sense uh, because uh, first it's not on the main site so we're not going to disrupt the the harbor we can actually do that work and, and have that be separate and and not interfere with the uh, the boat ramps not obviously ideal but under the circumstances we want to make sure we can complete what we believe that we know we can complete and then the second is that um, and this is really kind of a decision point for the board um, if the snack shack is included and we do go forward then there will be minimal dollars left in the three million dollar appropriation towards doing the garage <coughs> if the snack shack is removed that plus the sale of 203 bank means that it could potentially be a supplemental appropriation i think in either way uh, this project is probably going to need to have a, a supplemental appropriation to complete in its entirety so um, one of the things about why go out again and, and why you know would we get different results uh, we've we've learned I had no idea what a helix coil was before uh, <laughs> before we started this project but in the in the project that was laid out by the uh, architects there was hundred and seventy driven pilings which the estimated cost is about three thousand dollars per piling so a fairly expensive uh, process there is a these helix coils it's a mechanism in which they they drill into the ground to get the same support uh, those are about two thousand dollars so there's a thousand dollar savings so there's a potential of hundred and seventy thousand dollars worth of savings so we we thought as we were going through and, and again I really appreciate John's efforts we, we kind of hammered in uh, to go through some of the uh, elements of things that were in the project that we're not sacrificing quality uh, but we're getting some cost savings so in, in the um, in the industry I, I guess is really value engineering is, is what we were doing uh, we did include a, a detailed memo from uh, the architect Brown Lindquist and Finuccio uh, to do that the other component to this that that is um, made this project a, a little bit um, well it has a potential to be really positive uh, we have um, applied for uh, believe it or not five grants either we have applied or will be applying uh, five grants uh, two ADA grants uh, for 250,000 one in 2017 that was turned down one in 2018 that's still pending uh, John is putting forward the CPC grant for 250,000 uh, to help with uh, some of the elements of the decking system and the big one is the seaport grant for a million dollars uh, the seaport grant we won't have a decision until uh, January is what we've been advised so the the thought process is if we award the components that we know and see if we could put the seaport grant uh, if they'll allow us towards the the phase one if not then put that towards phase two if we get and I, I attached on the second sheet a um, I should have probably had this for a, a, a slide projector but I attached in here the the budget elements and, and what we think things are going to cost and when I say it, I'm very confident that we'll be able to do the phase one basically everything but the everything but the garage uh, and then if we leave the snack shack out uh, we're looking at having potentially about 635,000 available so that is a, a fairly decent amount and would put a pretty good dent I believe in, in doing the garage if we decide to do uh, the snack shack then we probably will have um, lesser well we, we will have a lesser amount available and we'll need to have a, a greater supplemental appropriation so uh, that's kind of where we are I think that we should try to capture uh, and do the work closest to the harbor get the um, a decision on the um, a decision on the uh, septic system and a decision on the snack shack I don't necessarily think tonight 
uh, that the board would have to make that decision. I think when the bid award comes in in November, we'll have Link will have enough time to make sure he can do the parking lot for the 100,000, <coughs> and we'll have actual bids in hand to, to make decisions about going forward. But I think it's important, it's an awful lot of material, but I think really it boils down to um, if we do not have the snack shack, then we will definitely include a food truck parking area so that we will do a, uh, a definite alternative so we're not ignoring the, the food uh, element. But I think John, and to his credit, and we, we heard of that finance committee meeting the other night, uh, that you know there is an element in the community that I think wants to have the snack shack included. So I think going back out to bid and, and seeing how those numbers come in with these cost savings elements in there, you know, will that be enough to, to make a difference? And until we have the bids in hand, we won't really have an answer to that. So we'll have an answer for the board uh, and a more final decision in beginning of November. Thank you, Chris. Janelle, any comments? Me first. Yeah. Uh, I want to go last. <laughs> <laughs> Julie? <laughs> I, have a, I, I have a couple questions because if we're looking at the re-engineering of, of the piers, so I'm assuming that there's, there's no structural issue in long term kind no. of Okay, no. so it's it's simply an alternative, more cost-effective way. A more cost-effective alternative to secure the base. Mm -hmm. And then um, these exterior fall protection railings, detailed as horizontal horizontal stainless steel cable rails, will then be replaced. So if and I just want to make sure I'm understanding it, you know, cosmetically even is that we're replacing like the steel cables. Yeah, the way the the way the uh, engineer and, and I think the engineer or architect sometimes they design things I think to last fifty years and there's two or three ways to get there. Mm. Uh, he had literally a steel cable that gets weaved in in kind of a, a web so as kids are walking along the um, the boardwalk they don't fall through. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, um, I think it was our our architect found in Horseneck Beach, uh, which is a very large uh, beach that the, uh, the state has. They use a, uh, a mesh that's um, a coated mesh. So it, instead of having a steel look, it will have a, a black mesh look, um, I don't know, a patterned look to it. I don't know if I, I don't think I put that material in here, but it will have a, a nice appearance, which is what we want to do. The functionality of it is to make sure that kids can't go over uh, the side if, when they go uh, when they're on the boardwalk. Okay, um, and then eliminate 750 square feet of elevated deck area west of the proposed north-south ramps. Yeah, on, on that one, uh, the part of the, oh, thank you, John. So here's that, that mesh. It comes in panels and they can cut it in, so it's a, a more a cost-effective way of doing it. What we found is the 750 square feet, well, I think there's two. Um, on the 750 square feet, the area, if we don't put the snack shack in, you don't really need to have a boardwalk that, that borders up to it. So we would reduce the size of the boardwalk to um, and take into account the loss of the uh, snack shack. And that would be grassed over. So instead of having boardwalk system, it, you just have a, a grass area. That savings was about fifty about fifty thousand dollars. But then, if we're to add the snack shack in, we're missing this deck. We would we would include that in. That would be part of the uh, the the um, add alternate it would be the snack shack and the decking. Okay. I guess my question is, um, if we have this <coughs> as an ad alternate <coughs> what happens if we move forward and we move this piece with the idea that we're going to come back to it so now we're going to have construction come back into that area after this yeah, main I, I, piece I think what we have here is the base project minuses out the snack shack and the decking that borders the snack shack so if we want the snack shack, we want the decking at the same time to have a platform to put picnic tables or, or what have you so people will get their food and be able to sit there and, and eat it. Right. So I, okay. 
in other words, I guess my question is that so we're looking at this as twofold: is we either take it out or we keep it in. But my question is, it's not a later phase then. No. It, oh, okay. All right. Great. It's, Thank you. We move forward with the base design, or we move forward with the base design plus the snack okay. track and decking. Thanks. Yeah, I guess my uh, question has two general themes. One, I think, is, is similar to Julie's, mm -hmm. is that, uh, and I think you've explained it, but I'd hate to do away with the, uh, the decking, per se, in the boardwalk, because we've been talking about making this to be uh, a value to the town, just not the boulders. And the deck and boardwalk, those two, in my mind, were critical of that, that overall vision. And then the... Uh, well, just uh, uh, if I the could. Path being, and then the other, excuse me, then the other part was, was being sure we had uh, safe passage for the pedestrians walking through there. And yeah, when I so when I say boardwalk, I just want to make sure from the parking okay. area to the to where the boats are, all that decking stays, all that boardwalk stays. We're just talking about the section that would uh, match up to the snack shack only. Okay. So the entire ADA part stays in, as part of the project. And then the second general uh, thought I have is, and I've been, you know, as John knows, I've been worried about the cost of things. But when I read through this list, and, and I'm not a construction person, so <laughs> forgive me, uh, we're making a lot of changes to the gutters, to the, uh, you know, to save money. And I would like to just increase, I guess, my comfort level that we're not making short-term cuts that are going to cost us long-term. I hate to I hate to go the route of trying to get under you know the same yeah, snack I think jack that's a and put us in jeopardy later on. I think that's a very fair question. And if you notice, what we didn't do was we we intentionally went through. This is the architect's recommendation. So anything that he thought was too much or or beyond the, the scope, uh, he he would have pushed back. Uh, and he knows that the instruction that we gave him is you know we don't want to be looking at this for. 30 or 40 years, so we don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize 30 to 40 years. So I don't think any of these things really do jeopardize uh, 30 or 40 years. I say just, just because of there's numerous of them, you know, items. So. Go ahead, John. If I can, um, John Rendon, Harbor Master. Just so you know, like, the big element that Chris referred to is the helical piles vice the standard driving of piles. And that decision was not made lightly. It went through G... Uh, geotech engineers and structural engineers analysis and that's why it kind of took us a while to get to this point so it, it has gone through you know the professional engineers assessment that it would have no effect on the boardwalk element of this project and that boardwalk is still intact it's just a very small section that would be in front of the snack shack and that snack shack is elevated on piles therefore you have to have that section of boardwalk leading up to it. If that goes away, then that need would not, I mean, the need for that small section would, wouldn't be needed. As far as the other ones, you know, it's still a metal roof vice, our standard shingle roof that, that everybody uses here. Again, I, I think the metal roof was trying to tie into the character and the beauty of the buildings. Um, it's a little more costly, and so you know, one of the changes was to go with the standard shingles. I don't think from a long-term perspective, I mean, every, you know, they're what everybody uses. So, I mean, there's elements like that that would have been great to have, um, but I don't, I don't think, and we were very careful not to jeopardize the quality of what we're getting. Don? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't know, I'm going to go in a completely different direction here because I'm concerned about the underlying assumption in this memo. Uh, um, there, there are two things that we sold this uh, town meeting with. The, uh, the, the office, uh, I mean, aside from the pilings and the, uh, the water side, uh, the, pile, the office and the garage. W we've been trying to get out of the old firehouse on Bank Street since I was a selectman back in the early 2000s. It, and it concerns me that we're having all this conversation about the snack shack and we're not thinking in terms of, okay, we need to fund the garage, and the garage has to be built at some point. Uh, and I'm I'm worried at some point that that's going to be a discussion about well, we need more money, uh, or else you're not going to get a garage. So, I'd I'd like to know 
how this underlying assumption fits in was in terms of the project is it, is it better to build it somehow later and it's going to cost us a lot less money if we do it that way or was that just dropped because it facilitated being able to afford all the other elements well, I think the problem is that you know we were hoping that we could do everything for three million and the bids didn't come in that way so we had to make some decisions if we leave the garage in and take the snack shack out there is a potential that we get a bid that we cannot award because we don't have sufficient funds so by removing the garage we definitely know that we can do that portion of the project so it, it's not it's, it's not ideal I mean I, I give you that and if we do go and sell like town meeting authorized 203 Bank Street and it can generate some revenue then potentially we would use that revenue to offset hopefully the additional cost and, and do the garage uh, as we had told town meeting by using some of the proceeds from the sale of 203 bank towards this project I, I understand that uh, mr. chair uh, my concern is it's somewhat like building a school in sequence and you build the, the office the gym the auditorium uh, and you say you're going to build the classrooms later uh, I mean, this was an operational component of this thing uh, it, we're operating out of a building that's quite a distance away from the harbor <laughs> and I know I, when I voted uh, on the override I mean it was with the thought that we're going to upgrade the operations there uh, in the snack shack no offense to the snack shack isn't as important as the garage thank you Don so I'm going to start off thanking John and the Sacklatucket Development Committee um, I know you've worked tirelessly on this we are so far outside of the scope of this project and I, I've had the opportunity to meet with Chris and John individually on our, on our Wednesday morning meetings we're so far outside of the scope of this project and so far beyond what we sold to the voters what we sold to the neighbors during the initial public hearings um, what was sold to this board of selectmen what was sold to finance committee we are so far beyond the scope of this and and I really can't understand a memo that would put a four hundred thousand dollar snack shack ahead of a maintenance building and we've had this conversation so I just don't get where that comes from four hundred thousand dollars for a 550 square foot snack shack with no tenant no lease no anything it was an idea and we're now willing to forego the maintenance building which by all accounts John's in a um, old fire station that desperately needs to get out of now let me l let's talk about Brown Linquist Panuccio and Raber which I'll just refer to as the engineer and architect at this point he came before us with a with a detailed set of plans he came before the neighbors and Sacratucket Development Committee and Waterways Committee with a detailed set of plans he sat before us and the first question I asked was can this be a phased project I asked that question because it was impossible to build what he was what he was doing for three million dollars which was the number that we were at so he comes in at five point two million dollars he's now back the project to three point six million dollars and then now he's gone to just under three million which doesn't include the septic system which doesn't include the site work um, and we're talking about having our DPW do it so I can't support this project at all what I did say to John and Chris in the Wednesday morning meeting John desperately needs a building he desperately needs a new Harbor Masters building and that we should go back to town meeting with plans for a phased project that makes sense not consider putting a snack shack ahead of his maintenance facility not sacrificing um, materials not sacrificing design not sacrificing anything that was originally sold to people now I look at the the helicoil pilings if that was that much of a cost savings why didn't the engineer and architect propose that in the beginning why if metal roofing was more expensive why was that proposed in the beginning what favors has this company done to us at the tune of three hundred thousand dollars he's charged the town of Harwich three hundred thousand dollars and now we're so far beyond the scope of this project we've I would say wasted three hundred thousand dollars of taxpayer money John a question for you you 
you stood before us and I asked the question, how much is the contract with this company? Yeah. And, and I didn't get a chance to pull the tape today or read the minutes, but I believe you said it was $250,000. $250,000 is what we were appropriated for engineering. And, and what I was told was that their contract, whether they designed it one time, two times, three times, or five times, was $250,000. Their, their contract was two eighty nine. dollars That's what they were hired at. Okay. Our appropriation was two fifty. dollars Okay. We were able to accept their bid. They were low bid because we had an hundred eighty seven five dollars grant towards the engineering design okay. of that. So my sense on the 187, and I believe I asked the question, but I don't, sorry, I don't have the minutes, okay. was the money that was left from the CZM grant was to be used for engineering, and then the balance of the money was going to be turned back over to the town as an offset to the $250,000 appropriation. Now we're at $300,000 with this company, and we have plans, and now we're, as a town, dissecting a project that we sold to everybody. And at what point do we stop doing business with this company? At what point are they liable for grossly underestimating this project? And I guess that's a question really for you, Chris. John, it was just for the number of what you told us it was. At what point are they liable and at what point do we stop doing business with them? Because I see this as, as, as a disservice to the community and the taxpayer. Yeah, I, I'm going to have a hard time sitting here defending that. You know, they didn't put us in a tough spot, okay, because I, I do think they did put us in a tough spot. I, I do also, though, Mr. Chairman, believe that we, we did say to town meeting that we would do the Harbor Master's Office. I mean, the plan that we showed town meeting is still the plan that we're trying to implement. My concern would be if we forego this plan and start over again, now we have to, n at least in my experience, I've never had one designer go and pick up the work of another designer. They all want to start from scratch. So we're looking at the initial investment to, to start over again would be 200 and, you know, the, the 298 or 289. So you're looking at potentially $300,000. And if, we, if they are able to design it, you know, within the $3 million, then we're, we're still 300000 above and beyond where we were. So I know this is, you know, this is a less than desirable position to be in. The, the point that was made, and, and John and I have had a disagreement, you know, in terms of this. I, I tend to agree that when I sat at town meeting, that town meeting understood that the snack shack was the lowest of the priorities. That was my recollection, that we should try to do the garage in, in order to get to the garage. But I, I think... Following this recommendation gets the boardwalk, gets the harbor master's office, gets the um, the septic, and if the if the snack shack is eliminated, then that makes life a whole lot easier. I'm saying that I'll let him I'll let him say his his two cents on the snack shack, and then I think we are really close to being able to do the garage. So the, the garage work, because it's in a separate location, even under the existing bid, was going to be done where it could be done phased a month or two after the Harbor Master's office were done. So we're really not that far afield. The question that will be answered when we get the bids in is when, when we do the bids again and get the bid result in, there is a potential that we're able to do everything but the snack shack within the existing appropriation. Chris, just in, in response to that, because you know we, we've changed the scope of this project, we've changed the materials of this project at this point. A, a, a lot of what was sold to Finance Committee, a lot of what was sold to this Board of Selectmen was a design. It was also sold to the neighbors, it was also sold to the, the committees, and we are now taking things out, changing scope of the project, changing the roof of the project, changing, to me, essential details of this project to give, to meet a, a number. At what point do we say this is not what we came forward with? At what point do we stop rushing? Because I remember last year we were trying to get to town meeting, and that's why we let them go to funding, the funding phase of the architectural work, um, rather than having it come back. At what point do we stop and at what point do we give John what he really needs, which is, and, and let's talk about need because the taxpayers need to be able to afford their taxes. They need 
the Harbor Masters building, right, John? I mean, isn't that what you really need? That's correct. Can I comment? Sure. I, I don't think we're that far one from what we've presented to the to the uh, to the town. I just don't. We put the snack shack in as an ad alternate. It's not part of the base bid. It's not priority, but we put it in there because that's what we sold to the voter. That doesn't mean you have to vote for it. If we don't want it, we take it out. I, I mean, that's why it's not part of the base bid. The garage is very important, but I've heard it from you. I've heard it from a number of people. Why are we doing the garage? Why are we paving the Downey property? We're not, I don't think we're changing the project to the point where it's not what the voters voted for. Every project you have to adjust. We are making some adjustments. The metal roof over the shingle roof, I really don't think the average taxpayer knew we were putting an average roof when they, a uh, metal roof when they voted for the project. I just don't. We're trying to live within the means. We found after the first bid that we were a little short. We had no contingency money left over after we did um, the deducts. And we have been working hard at this project. We've been over two years in the working. It's not like we're rushing and throwing this together. The bids were off. Uh, there's a number of reasons why. You can blame the architect. Um, you can blame me. But the bottom line, it, it, they were off for a number of reasons. The soils ended up being bad to where we had to have piles. Um, you've heard, you know, it's the economy's booming and things are more expensive. I, I think the cost is ridiculous too, looking at it. I mean, I, it, it is, but that's, that's, that's the market. So I, I just hate to just throw this out the window and that's, you, we wanna talk about need, a harbor master is a need, a garage is a need, you've heard me consistently say that. But I felt compelled to try to present all the elements of the project to you. And if you don't want the snack check, take it out. We don't have to include it as an ad alternate. We did so because that's what we presented to the voter. John, just so you know, this is far beyond the snack shack for me. It, I, I know, it, but I'm just, you, you focused on that as far as, you know, why are we prioritizing over the garage? I'm not prioritizing over the garage. I'm also looking at site work. You know, and, sure. and, I, and I did tell you in the meeting last week that I was a fan of um, not a sea of asphalt, that I thought a gravel parking lot would be a better looking option. But that was also supposed to be in that bid. That, that, that landscape, the pavement, all of that stuff was supposed to be in the bid. And now we've taken it out. So, so Mr. Chairman, so does no project, you make adjustments along the way to try to get within the number? I mean, I would think that we're trying to be responsible in that manner without hugely impacting what the, what the voter made. And certainly to a scope and a point, I can agree with you. Okay. But on this project, starting at you guys giving a $3 million number for a certain amount of work, us receiving a $5.2 million number, dropping to 3.6, dropping to 3, but it doesn't include, what do we think, 20, 25% of the project not included at this point or changed? No pavement. Septic system, Chris, wasn't in the original number. I, I just don't feel like this is the same project that we came forward to town meeting to the voters for. Absent the snack shack, okay. really not not hung up on it. Um, Janelle. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. you want to know what I really think? I um, I'm still hung up on the 5.2 million dollar plan because it was beautiful, and um, not being a boater, um, I really liked the idea of the 50 seat cafeteria. So. Um, the back of my mind, I'm still hung up on that a little bit because it's our only waterfront property, town-owned waterfront property. Everybody in town should be able to enjoy it. A food truck isn't going to do anything for me personally. There's nothing exciting about having a food truck in a parking lot and not having a nice area with the, like the park has that nice, um, what do they call it? You know, <laughs> the thing they just built, not gazebo, but. Oh, the court thing? The uh, pavilion. Oh, yeah. Um, but so I'm trying to wrap my head more around um, the creation of what we want the harbor to be and not the numbers as much. But that's who I am. I, I'm a very creative person. I envision something and um, I'm not a numbers person as far as where are we going to get the money? That's why there's a board of five of us here, very different styles. That's why I'm not part of the finance committee. Um, so that's my, my vision. Although, 
I do understand what you're saying, Michael. This is completely different than what we were sold. I understand what John's saying, that the economy is booming right now, so these bids came in super high. So maybe we should go back to the drawing board with a grand vision with a five or 10 year plan. Um, I don't know if we can use this same architect. Um, I understand the frustration. I, I totally share that with you. Like how can you come forward with a 5.2 million project when we told you it was 3 million? I, I get that, but at the same time, I understand why waste $300,000 again. So I, I don't really know what to say. I don't really have a concrete answer. I think it's, um, we have to consider all these things, but I think definitely we've got to phase no matter what, because we don't have the money. John? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to go back to, wor to where I was before. Uh, I'm not disagreeing with <coughs> the comments that the board members have made, but uh, frankly, looking at the budget presentation earlier uh, tonight, uh, if it's a great idea and we sell it to the public, that's great. But in this case, we're jettisoning one of the two operational components of this uh, that, that were real important. Uh, the, the garage should not be pushed off so that we can squeeze in whatever we could squeeze in under the cap, if you will, uh, and then hope that, because I could see this happening, and go back to town meeting and say, boy, we need some more money because we couldn't do the garage. And the garage makes a better hostage, I suppose, uh, but it, it, it's an operational component. The other parts of this are part aesthetic, part economy, uh, uh, and I and I could see the grand vision. I actually th think it would be a great idea, uh, but within the context of where we are financially, we should be doing the two operational things uh, first, and then working our way towards building that up into something special. Thank you, Don. Leo. Actually, I have a question for us, and then I'll have a comment on the Healy Core. Uh, it was mentioned that there was test borings done on the uh, land side property. Could I ask through the chair, uh, I guess to John, how many test borings were actually done out there to determine the quality of the soil? I, I don't know the total number. They did a number of different spots around the building where the footprint of the building was going to go, and then along the area where the um, Boardwalk was going to be. I don't know the total number. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just for the record, in a previous life, I do have a civil engineering degree, and I will tell you that the use of helicoids can can cause problems sometimes. They are directly related to the uh, quality of the soil in which they're used. So, although you're looking at that move as a cost-saving feature, uh, I'm for it. I think it's a good idea. But I just want to caution you that I, I believe that before an engineer is going to go that route, they're going to do some extensive test borings because that whole area was backfilled and jury-rigged for years and years ago, you know, 2,000 years ago I'm going back now because soil conditions aren't just what you see today. They're, they were what was there 2,000 years ago. So um, I just want to caution you as you move forward in, uh, in accepting that uh, type of uh, piling. Um, with that said, uh, taking this project in uh, phases, what a novel idea, huh? <laughs> I, I think some simple-minded farmer came up to the town meeting and made an amendment to the project and asked for that to be done and was, it wasn't accepted by the voters at the time. I, I don't want to say it was overwhelmingly turned down. I do believe there are people in this community that believe that that was a good idea then. And I certainly think that um, it's coming to fruition, that that is a good idea. As a taxpayer in this community, times quite a bit, not just one home. So every time someone says it's only going to cost me a cup of coffee, it's going to cost me a lot more than one cup of coffee. Um, but as a taxpayer, I was approached to buy the Downey property. I was sold on buying the Downey property because of this massive need that the Harbour Master had uh, in putting a uh, maintenance shed there. All for it, supported it, spoke in favor of buying the Downey property, spoke in favor of having the Harbour Master build a building there. 
I'm not in favor of the monies going from the existing firehouse on Oak Street to go directly to this project because I don't believe the taxpayers, the voters, the people of town meeting really want that, number one. This previous town meeting, I think there was overwhelming support for you people to work with some local conservation group to maybe make use of that property. So to clearly state that we're going to get 300000 plus for that and, and, and dedicate it to this project, I don't believe you have town meeting support for that action. I don't believe you have all the taxpayers' support for that action. That's a town-owned piece of property. I own one eleven thousandths of it. Nobody asked me about where they were going to spend the money. Just, so just for clarification, it is in the packet that we will be – that has to go back to town meeting. You are correct. Thank you. So in order to spend that money, it still has to go back to town meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, with all respect to the administrator, the idea proposal that he put forward to you, I'm going to use his, his quote, it's not an ideal plan. You're damn right it's not an ideal plan. I think it's a horrible plan. Town meeting voted, and again, there were options out there. There were people opposed to it. Town meeting had an excellent discussion on it. Town meeting voted $3 million. They voted $3 million for all three components of this plan. They didn't vote to spend $3 million on the snack shack, the office, the boardwalks, and then, because you know damn well what's going to happen, next year you're going to come back to town meeting and ask for an extra million to do the maintenance shed, which as Selectman Howell stated, is the best hostage to hold. And he's right. That's what's going on here. You're going to take out a very important part of this project that many taxpayers were in favor of for years, over five years ago. We started talking about building that out there. And you're going to hold it hostage. And you're going to come back to us and ask for the extra million to finish it. Because you're going to add on the other things, as the chair has mentioned, the 25 percent of the projects that you're not doing. I absolutely am opposed to what's being discussed here this evening, absolutely opposed to it. I think the taxpayers deservingly should be given an opportunity to look at these projects and once again either decide if they want to spend five and a half million, as Selectman Brown suggests, or stick to the three million and have a scaled down project. I'm not saying throw the architect out. I'm not saying throw the plans away and spend another $250,000 for plans. Absolutely not. You have the plans. You have the general designs of the buildings. But to stage this project is the way it should have been done last year at Maytown meeting. I proposed it then and it got shot down. Fine. I'm, I'm one that always takes my hits. If I get shot down, I'll go with it. But now for you people to determine how you're going to stage it and for you people to spend my $3 million on one-third of the project and then come back and tell me you need another million to complete it, I'm not going to stand for that. That I will not stand for. You have $3 million authorized by the taxpayers of this town to complete this entire project. Entire project. That means everything. Now, I'm not talking about changing the shingles from metal to, to asphalt. That's fine. I can understand that, and I'm with Mr. Rendon on that. I'm not cha talking about changing railings from copper to brass or whatever to save money. That's fine. But I am talking about it when you do a massive change, like take out one-third of this project, the most important part, and you say, well, we're going to put it off and see if we get the money enough to do it. That I will not stand for. Because I'll tell you right now, you're going to be back in front of town meeting. You're going to be asking for an extra million dollars to finish that maintenance shed. And I will be the first one to the mic to get up and say, I'm sorry, John. You deserve that maintenance shed. You should have gotten it five years ago. But there's no way I'm going to support it now. Too bad. And I think you'll be surprised that there'll be some people up there alongside me, too. May not win, but you are definitely going to anger some people in this town. There's a process to do things. Yes, this thing went out to bid. Yes, it's a little over. If you cannot meet the $3 million by cutting unessential things, as Mr. Rendon has pointed out, changing roofing, changing some ways that you do things, going for the Healy Core piles, if you can't make the $3 million budget, 
don't do any of it then. Stand up and do the right thing and go back to the taxpayers and tell them, listen, we underestimated it. This project that you wanted and you voted is going to cost you three and a half million or three six. Do the right thing. Thank you. You know? Leo, I just want to clarify, I, didn't, I do not support a five and a half million dollar project. That's not what I said. I was saying I liked the design. I was sold on the design, the aesthetics of it. Mr. Costa. Thank you. Um, just taking a turn here, um, I know you have a tough decision and uh, a lot of elements to it. Um, for the future, it does point to the need to have bids prior to town meeting instead of getting them after the fact. Um, it was a past practice of past boards and um, it ended these kind of discussions. Maybe it would have come in at uh, 3.2 or maybe it would have come in at 3.5 or whatever. Maybe the taxpayers would have supported it. Maybe they wouldn't have. But uh, having the actual costs in hand, um, the, the estimate for the community center for years was three and a half million dollars. It was a 10 year old estimate when we finally voted on the community center. The, the bids came in at 5.4 million. Town meeting supported it. Um, they understood the differences and uh, had the thoughtful discussion on town meeting floor and voted it um, and then supported it at the ballot. So just um, as you make a decision and as you go forward, at least if you do are going to rebid and do things differently now, uh, you're going to have bids prior to town meeting um, to work with, make sure they're good enough to last long enough to town meeting. But that's, I guess, my two cents worth. Thank you. Julie? Um, so I, I have various comments because I think that ultimately, and Janelle, I do agree with you. I think the original plan was beautiful, and it's unfortunate that uh -huh. we couldn't have that plan because it was quite nice and would have benefited the entire town. Granted, to be voted, Leo, I'm not implying that I want to spend people's money that we haven't voted properly. But I, I, I think it's interesting that we've had multiple projects in town that have gone over budget. And we've had them in various avenues of the town where some of them weren't sustaining. I mean, we've got a, a harbor and a lot of their fees are self-sustaining. I also think the process, although it would be great, to your point, Dana, about having a bid prior to, even the process of, of the pricing isn't an unusual process. And, and an architect and an engineer coming in and designing something and then revising and revising and revising is not an unusual proce a process. It happens frequently. And even value engineering, going from one type of pier to another type of pier is not unusual. And I would actually say that I, you know, I agree, we need to look carefully at all of this. This is taxpayer money we're spending. But going from one pier to another type of pier, that's not uncommon. And, and the other part of that is value engineering is called value engineering for that reason. Now you're looking at other ways to achieve that. That's not unknown to people. Overall, this is something that's supposed to benefit all of the people in the town. Doesn't matter how many properties you own, because you get the benefit of owning extra properties, but it's to benefit all of the town. That includes non-boaters, that includes people who want to just go visit an artist shack and maybe grab a bite. It, it involves every piece of this town, so I agree that financially and fiscally we have to be responsible, but we have to also look behind and above and beyond that dollar. I also would say that, you know, we have multiple other issues here where we're saying, okay, so we're compromising the office space, which was the driving factor. We're, we're holding that hostage, actually. I would disagree with that because the ultimate, to John's point, I, I don't see this project as vastly different to your point, Leo, and to other people in this, in this room talking about phases. Sure, great, That's, that would have been ideal if we knew everything from the beginning, it would have been perfect. But overall, every construction project goes through different revisions for various reasons. And so I hate to see this entire project have to be put aside 
the entire thing be rebid. The idea that we would ever switch engineers at this point is, is not feasible. We're only going to spend more money. We are, and again, this is common that an engineer and an architecture firm would look and look again and look at, again at cost-saving measures. Some of them are aesthetics. However, to build this snack shack after you build this office doesn't really make sense to me when you're going to bring back in heavy equipment, you're going to be tearing some things up again, and you're going to compromise that. And losing that extra deck space, how do we go back to build all that after the fact? You have to look at what you're supposed to do. It, it, you talk about phasing. If you want to look at how you're supposed to build it, including it as at least an ad alternative makes more sense than saying you'll do it at a later date for construction purposes, for cost overall. And again, we do have an economy that's booming. We do have all of the, you know, there are certain, there are certain uh, products, there are certain metals that are costing more based on the economy. And a lot of those numbers are not known till those bids go out. And then when you have to revise them, you have to recalculate those numbers again. So I think we need to look very carefully at this. Granted, we're talking about serious money, but we also need to think about, are we going to cost ourselves more in the long run? And I don't think that we're holding an office hostage. Thank you. Uh, I, le I agree with Dana and you, Julie. I think you're, we're getting a little out of hand here. Uh, I think I'm, along with John, is one of the few people that were all these meetings. I don't recall Leo ever being at any of the meetings. Irrelevant. Now. And Keep it to the facts. what I'd like to say is I like what Chris mentioned about going out for bids. Now, what's changed is the areas of, you're talking the roof and the other areas, uh, I never was totally in favor of going right out for a full-ledged restaurant. I liked the idea of a, a snack bar that had maybe a canopy and tables, which is what I thought it was originally. John and I discussed the uh, pavement area and things like that. I think what we need to do, if it doesn't cost a ton any money or it doesn't take the time, is go out for bids of all of these as we want it now which is what the, the, the town meeting said. Uh, I'm in favor of the project incorporating everything that we can. The problem we have is everybody has an opinion, but nobody has the numbers. And I was pushed into this when we had this before. We were rushing to get to town meeting, and all of a sudden we've got the engineer here talking about oh, this is what it's going to cost, and these are the, the crazy things you wanted, and here's the realistic things you wanted, and it caused a real problem. I repeat, I think we have some ideas, and, and the John's worked with Chris and others, and I like what Dana's saying, and you're very right, Julie, because you're in that business. If we slow down a little bit and look at what we really want, as it was specified, and go out for bids again with those minor changes or major changes, we'll know exactly where we are. If we have to then go back to town meeting and say, as you mentioned, everybody else did, and they're talking about in Nantucket, they're talking in Provincetown, all of a sudden prices for doing these kind of projects, partly because of changes of regulations for spe septic systems, changes in regulations for flood zones, changes in reg, all these, changes have come about in the last year or so and in Provincetown they said it doubled the cost of replacing those buildings that were in, on f in that fire. So I'd like everybody just to slow down a little bit and let's look at a way that we can look at this realistically of accomplishing what originally was requested by the town meeting using the capabilities and the description that fits this. Let's get the bid numbers if they're 3.1 million, okay, well, how do we deal with it with grants and everything else? That's one thing. If I don't think they're, go they're gonna come back at 5 million because those were extras of options. If they come out with more, just as they did at the water side, we're gonna have to find ways that are satisfactory to the taxpayers to accommodate that. 
So I ask you to please reconsider this on a common basis of how can we proceed ahead with the original plans within the budget that fits the uh, taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I'd just like you to clarify, everybody has an opinion, but nobody has the numbers. Am I confused? Because I had the numbers. I had the numbers when they were 5.2. I had the numbers when they were 3.6. I had the numbers when they were 2997, but it didn't include the site work or the septic system. We have a whole spreadsheet in here with Chris's recommendation with numbers. The only thing we're going to go do now is rebid the project with the change in specs. And I, I, I certainly appreciate Julie's comments because of what she does for a living. But I would say that she represents a client one client and they go back to them with change orders and they say we're going to do this we're going to do this and we're going to change we represent the voters mr chairman do we have the exact number for the septic system well we have an exact number for the septic system yes because that went out to bid and we got that number but what we don't have is we don't have a new number including the snack shack as an alternate so certainly we can create a menu but yes matt we have a number for the septic but system. we don't have it for the site Plan. We don't have it for the site plan because we're gonna now going to have DPW do the work to save money and go beyond the scope of the project. And before we were going to have the town do the septic system. The engineering. The engineering and, and the pricing on it was Correct. supposed to be from that. Correct. What we had was estimated prices before. We now just recently, as you said, we got the the bids on the septic system. So that's one That's one number. I just wanted to clarify because there's numbers. We have a lot of numbers in our packet. And that, that's why I've said from the beginning of this conversation, it's a very different project. And this board needs to decide if it represents what we brought before town meeting. I, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. But also in the bidding process, you're going out to the subcontractors again that have to look at the new configuration. So you don't have the numbers for the electricians, the plumbers, or the builders. It's, it's not a difference of opinion, it's a different value you're looking at. We don't have those numbers. We want those numbers if, to find out <clears throat> if there is. Now there's a problem with this because those subcontractors are now going to have to bid out a year. So what you've got right now is already inflated or due to a profit and the, and the progress. So it's a gamble that the cost could be higher because they're not going to bid something that they have to bid today and deliver in a year. But we've got to have something to make it tangible. Thank, Thank you. you. Don? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to that point, I didn't want to get as geeky as all this, but uh, Julie just opened the door to that before. Uh, I used to be you know, a senior contracting officer with the federal government, and I'm looking at this in another way that's kind of collateral to what Julie's looking at. We. I thought we got too cute in the way we're doing this. Add-ons give an opportunity for somebody to low bid the initial platform in order for them to jack up the ability to make profit on the, uh, the add-ons. What concerns me about that methodology is it doesn't recognize things like you've already got people on the site doing things and it doesn't cost double to do a little bit more. Uh, let's talk about paving. I mean, uh, you're already paving something and you want to add 50 percent more to a parking lot it doesn't cost 50 percent more because they've already got the trucks out and uh, now it's just an increment of materials essentially and a little bit more labor uh, the way we're doing this nibbling around the edges with all of these add-on 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 things just invites people to take portions of this project and inflate them because if they can get the base bid they can uh, they got their foot in the door to get the uh, the increments. I would be far uh, more interested in seeing this go out to bid with everything, uh, it, the respecking of everything. And if indeed uh, that was a problem, offer the opportunity for alternate bids uh, somehow, but not alternate add-ons. That's a whole different methodology, and it only results in you fishing for something you might have gotten a better package from the yeah. second or third bidder if they knew they were going to get all the work. And, they, and that was, if it was awarded, you're getting it all. I think you have to, you have to consider, if I don't get uh, alternate two or alternate three, then I got to load in my profit and the base bid plus the first alternate. And it distorts what you're really trying to do. I'm getting right. distorted now. Yeah, I am. Uh, well, I, I know ahead. Julie understood what I just said. Yeah, and for clarification purposes, 
I am looking at it from a taxpayer's point of view. I'm not looking at it from only what I do for a living. I'm looking at it for what we committed at town meeting and what we're trying to accomplish and to not lose a project that benefits the entire town in a cost-effective manner, but in a smart way that it doesn't cost us much more in the long run or we go backwards. We go into a project, we back out of it to do something else, and then we go back in. That doesn't make any sense to me. I, I do think, Mr. Chairman, you know, one of the things that we had an opportunity, we went through the budget, <clears throat> we revamped it, we put elements in that we did not know before, and, you know, I, I just want to be clear, we're pretty close, and we went through and we were able to get value engineering somewhere in the range of two to 300000 and, you know, quite honestly, I, I think where we are is we can ha have the architect make these adjustments. I don't know how much we didn't get a number yet from him. Let's just say for planning purposes around $5,000 go out and see what was the value of the 300,000 two to 300,000 that we saved in the value engineering and does that get us where we need to be? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a better conversation to have come back in November and let's see where we are. And I hear, I mean, you know, I, I really resent the, the accusation that we're holding the, the garage hostage. That was neither John nor my intent. We're trying to do things from a business perspective and you don't want to go back in and tear up a pavement once you do it once. So that was off to the side. We can certainly see about getting that designed and get that bid a little quicker. The original design had that coming in two months after the, the main building anyway. So we can do that work and, and accelerate and try to get that in. And there's no reason why that area couldn't be constructed in the summer because we're not going to be interfering with the, the, the ramp system and we're not going to be interfering with the pier system. I just I think it is important that we go in and try to deliver to the taxpayers what we told them. And if value engineering, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. This isn't the first rodeo for doing value engineering. Let's see what value we actually got out of it. We speculate it's at least 200000 Let's see what that means to this project and can we deliver it. Why wouldn't we put an aggregate for that? <coughs> Under the under the bid law, this is the this is the way to do it. We, okay. we don't have that flexibility. Leo? Uh, thank you, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I, maybe you guys misunderstood me. I'm 100% behind value engineering. I said that. I have no problems with going from steel to asphalt for going piles to the helicore piles if they, in fact, will work. That's smart. You're doing your job there. I commended John for doing that. I stood right here a couple of minutes ago and said he's doing the right thing, cutting those costs, going from the steel cable to different cables. That is excellent. That's what we should be doing. Chris is the one, though, that our town administrator said while I was sitting over there that he wanted you to be aware of if, in fact, you were to vote the office, the boardwalk, and the snack shop that it was real good chance there was not going to be enough money left of the three million that you have to spend to do the maintenance bond. And that's what resonated with me and that's why I got up to the mic the first time. So I don't want to see you go down that route. Selectman Howell is the one that said you were holding it hostage. I just quoted him. And I saw that turning into a, a situation in which we were going to build the office, the snack shop, the boardwalk, spend two million, two and a half million, two point eight million, and then not have enough left over to do the uh, maintenance bond and have to go back to the town meeting for that. And that was my concern. The only other thing I want to leave you with tonight is I've said on town meeting floor, I will say again, I will say in front of you people, this town needs a five year capital plan. And it needs a five-year capital plan that you cannot change by simple majority vote on town meeting floor. Because if you have that, this is where you end up, right here, with this kind of cluster screw-up. <laughs> Five-year plans, and, 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 and what Chris did, that work that he did showing you up there where our budget's going to go in the next five years, I commend him for that. That's excellent work. That's excellent strategy for you people. 
but you can take all that capital line and just throw it away because it basically means nothing because if you don't have a capital plan that you have to stick to that takes two-thirds majority vote of town meeting to change, Chris cannot do his job fairly to be able to predict what our capital expenses are going to be in five years. You just can't ask that man to do it because the town meeting could be filled with people who want to vote a project. We have the tech school coming up now, 10 million. This got passed, the Harvard got passed, Watch side got passed. People will pass it, they'll go to the falls and pass it, and it's making your life that much harder when it comes to try to balancing a budget and projecting out. Really, really take this as a lesson for how important a five-year capital plan is, a true five-year capital plan, not just a piece of paper that has, this is what we're spending this year, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure of the board. Do we want to bring this back? We have a, a lot left on the agenda. and I, I think we have a lot left. Uh, I, if I can just, uh, you know, listening to all this, a couple of comments. If we, if we were to do a full scope, as Don, you suggested, that, that implies that we put it off till a year from now. Because we have, you know, three million has been passed, so that would pretty much put that off, put this off. Uh, we've been in the Capital Outlay Committee. They've been talking about providing a new uh, office for John John, what, eight years maybe now? I'm trying to think when I first was looking at that. And it's always been postponed until next year until we, uh, until this comes forward. I don't see a problem, and I think we should probably come back again, but at this point, uh, I don't see a problem in, in learning what's happening with this new, with the bids to see what these aspects cost, to see how close we are and how much we aren't. You know, and I don't see I don't see why we can't go ahead and make that decision to go ahead and uh, right. get those facts. And, you know, I'm going to bring this back next week because I think we've talked about this subject long enough, and I think we all need to think about it. The problem with going out to bid is if we're in disagreement on, I guess if we add it as an ad alternate, the the uh, snack shack, there's no harm, no foul. There's no harm, no foul. You can take it out, and make that decision in November. So, do we want right. to have Chris um, rebid this? I, I do. I do. Otherwise, we we just we'll be we're talking just wasting time. Like this. Right. Is we're the uh, garage time. Added, added in this bid, or is that separate now? We, we would have to do it separate. Mm. We can try to accelerate that though, and and get that bid out. But based on what you find, we based on what we, we find, we, we might will not have a right. much better exactly. idea. That we, we may be forward. even closer than we think. That's right. Right. And so what's the harm in doing that? Because at least we're taking some action and moving forward rather than just waiting to discuss it again and possibly, you know, either way, we're delaying things and delaying the process and prices and all of that. It doesn't make sense to me to continue. John. Mr. Chairman, I would just say they could, they could bid the garage tomorrow, frankly. There, there's no change in the scope of the garage. So, I mean, they're ready to, I mean, not tomorrow, but I mean very soon they could rebid. John. That's the pleasure. Yeah, just to clarify uh, where I'm at, even if the garage was separate, I think it, that could go out separately. Uh, I'm not a big fan of these add-ons because you have to account for yeah. the fact that <laughs> you can buy continue. your way in at the bottom level and then you account for the extra oh, levels. I, I, that part I got. When I was talking about the aggregate, I was talking about put the project out to bid. Right. Absent the building for the maintenance, but mm -hmm. put the project out. That way you can't have any shenanigans where somebody figures, if I give a really low bid in the base level and, and they really want this second level enough, then I can bid it higher and I'm still going to get the award. I mean, I'd like to see the scope be the scope and then go out for the bid because I think we're going to get a lower bid that way. Julie? But by rebidding, by going back and looking at these bids, we're, we're essentially accomplishing that without having to wait another year and piecing out the garage. Yeah, but he's putting the bids out with the ad alternate. I'd like to see yeah, I, a I grand think, bid. I, I think maybe <laughs> instead of the grand bid, um, because once we put everything in there, um, you know, then I, I think we're, we run the risk of being too close. But there's no reason why we can't do the two bids, have them do at the same time, and then just do the math and, and total up and right. see what we get. Exactly. So we can accelerate and do the garage bid at the same time that, that we do the main bid and get all the numbers for the board. You know. Is there any reason that the garage could not be built first if we end up phasing this? 
I think the reason for doing the, the Harbor Master's Office and the boardwalk is because we're doing the water side. So we need the handicap ramp system to kind of facilitate the, or the walk system so people can get from the, the parking area to the boat. I, I don't think you'd want to stop, right. you know, and, and gotcha. mm -hmm. not be able to go all the way. <coughs> I have no problem with going back out to bid. And I respect, certainly respect everything everybody said. We've already been out to bid. And if we bid the project as voted by town meeting, even with the few changes that are represented, we're going to be over. But if we want to go through the exercise, let's go through the exercise. <laughs> I'm not as confident as you, Mr. Chair. Because either way, you're saying we're coming back for the garage. And if we're coming back for the garage, we're going back <coughs> to town meeting for additional funds for the garage. So. Possibly. Right. Possibly. Possibly. Not definitely. I mean, if, and well, a site work number as well. Keep laughing, Leo. And I, I would like to suggest some sort of conversation with the architect and engineer that I'm looking at the spreadsheet. It was $289,000 contract. They're already to $300,000. Um, and I do not blame John Rendon or, the, or Sacratucket Harbor. I do blame the engineer for coming forward with what he came forward with originally. Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. So you're set, Chris? We're set. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Moving on to discussion of management of Bell's Neck Bog. We, uh, we, we touched on this earlier, and uh, I'll, I'll start this by saying we uh, realize that we have no jurisdiction over conservation, and this is your land. Um, I put the letter that was sent to us by the resident that was interested in, in farming this bog. Um, so I brought it back for conversation. The, the initial conversation on this, I believe, was July 3rd in a, at our meeting. Um, it makes sense to me. Uh, I did read the mi minutes um, from your meeting where you guys discussed it, and you guys discussed studying uh, and doing other things on the bog. Cranberry farming is obviously part of the heritage of the town of Harwich, and <coughs> we have a local farmer that wants to farm it. My own sense is that we uh, at least enter into conversation with him and maybe go out, to, out with an RFP to talk about farming. But I would like to see, personally, like to see farming on that bog, but I uh, Mr. obviously. Mr. Chair, I would like to, uh, I concur with that for a lot of reasons. It's, uh, and it's basically, uh, just to add to that, as you said, Michael, it's, uh, it's our heritage. We're losing cranberry farms. There aren't that many left. I hate to lose any more. Uh, the third kind of comment I would make is, you know, Leo Kakunas, who uh, I argue with sometimes, but he's gone organic, so people are worried about uh, fertilizer and pesticides. But our other cranberry uh, bogs, at least when I met with them uh, a couple years ago, were very carefully following the extension service and minimizing effects of uh, uh, any chemicals that people are concerned with. So I think for some people, the view of uh, how people treat bogs are, are, is history. Things have progressed much beyond that, and we need to take consideration of that as well. So uh, that's my bias. You know. Yeah, I support it too. And this is just a recommendation, just so we know. We have no or bias. Don? Yeah, I support it, but I'd go a little bit further because we bought it uh, as a town. And I think the understanding was we were going to preserve it, but we were also going to preserve the heritage of the town in, in farming. So we, were got, we, we sold it on kind of a bunch of levels. I went back and looked at that. Uh, I'd kind of like to at least acknowledge that and have an overall plan that includes farming somewhere in it because that's kind of how I feel the money was achieved in the first place to buy it. Thank you, Don. Leo? Uh, yeah, for the record, I am not interested in uh, responding to the RFP uh, if the Conservation Commission so decides to send out that RFP, so I just want that clear. Um, I absolutely encourage the board uh, to vote to uh, ask the Conservation Commission to do this. Um, cranberry bogs are a um, cranberry business is a dying business. It's really very, very difficult to make a living in the cranberry industry right now. Uh, you should know that the uh, cranberry marketing committee just came out with a marketing order, which limits the amount of cranberries now that can be sold by a grower. So not only a grower is faced with um, the pricing being way down, but they also are limited now to how much they can produce and send in. And also, the handlers um, have a marketing order in place on them where they can only accept and handle so many uh, cranberries because the cranberry business is really, uh, it's, in, it's in tough dire straits right now. 
The good thing, though, is that if you guys get a farmer in there and you get someone in there that the Conservation Commission feels that they can work with, as I certainly have been working with Amy on things, um, it's just a plus for the town because uh, Amy doesn't have that in her, the Conservation Commission doesn't have money in the budget, the town doesn't have the wherewithal to manage that piece of property correctly, um, and basically for, you, you, you're getting help, you're getting free help from someone who's gonna be dedicated to farming the property and uh, to trying to continue to uh, you know, grow cranberries there. Not only that, there is an initiative right now which you need to know about, for a lot of cranberry growers are on board with it, especially local ones here on the Cape, in which uh, we're looking at other uses for cranberry bogs as opposed to growing cranberries. And uh, it's just, it's really, really interesting times right now for uh, cranberry owners because, um, again, the market itself and growing cranberries is, uh, it, it, it's pretty bleak. So uh, to have someone in there controlling it and controlling it under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission so that you're concerns of pesticides and herbicides uh, that Mr. Valentine mentioned are, 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 are being watched, uh, I, I just see it being as a plus plus. Um, I don't think the Conservation Commission can, can uh, take on that responsibility right now because there's a lot going on you know, with, with maintaining it. So I encourage you guys to do a, a positive vote today on that and send them a message that you really think it's the right thing for the community. Thank you. Thank you. the viewpoint of the Conservation Commission. The, the previous lease was discussed extensively whether it should be you know, issued because the Commission had concerns and I was on the Commission at the time. So I think that lease didn't work out particularly well for the Town of Harwich. So I think the present Commission wants to look at options and just see what might be possible for the site. So I think that's where we're coming into this and I think we're ready for an open discussion very soon. Thank you. Brad. Can I get a motion just to send conservation a letter with a suggestion to use that as cranberry? Uh, so moved. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> All right, next up is the electronic communica communications policy for elected officials and members of boards and commissions. So this was before us uh, July 10th in administrator's report. Um, I know I think it was Charlene along with the town planner that came up with in this one, it was just uh, Charlene. Just Charlene. Did, uh, Charlene took a stab at a policy. Um, <coughs> if you remember correctly, I think Leo actually stood before us um, after he did a public records request on Harbor Records. So this is basically the second reading of the policy is where we're, where we're at? And this is actually just discussion. Yeah, if just we were a legislature. Yeah. <laughs> discussion on, discussion on from the board on whether or not you want to adopt this policy. Don? The only, the only, other than a grammatical change that I suggested, uh, the the only thing that I'd bring up is, it says that it's effective uh, at the vote of the board of selectmen. And frankly, in talking to, to Foster, that, that ain't possible. I mean, uh, he's going to have to buy at a hundred dollars a license uh, access for mailboxes, and uh, everybody would be out of compliance until he completed his work. So I, I would suggest thirty or sixty days in this thing. To implement it, uh, I can. Uh, I would agree with that in the sense that, from another angle, and that is that uh, I find myself to be a bit in a transition. If someone emails me uh, on my personal email, uh, quite frankly, I email back, but I've been forwarding my email to the uh, town site because I talked to Foster, and that goes into the system then. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to take a, some time, I I think, for people to start using the town site for me in the meantime you know i'm putting it in the system to maybe it's a month maybe it's a couple months to make it realistic mm. do you know <coughs> um two things a hundred dollars per email box is what you're saying it costs the town a hundred dollars for one email address that's, that's insane that? first of all <laughs> that's insane <laughs> second no, of all <laughs> Um, so I, <laughs> I had a town email address assigned to me a couple of years ago, and um, it was very difficult to use on my phone, which is where, you know, I'm always on the go, so I use my phone. So Foster reconfigured my phone. I bought a new phone this summer. He reconfigured it. And what happens is it automatically deletes all my messages, and I don't know why. Um, and 
I can send from it, and it will, the messages that I receive will stay there for about a week, and then they're gone forever. So I don't use it. Uh, it's very, it's, it, it's cumbersome, um, and it also, the, it, I constantly get a message from my phone saying it, it has dropped the server or whatever. So I think before we adopt a policy, we need to look at our system, maybe find a better alternative than $100 a mailbox, because if you're going to ask all these chairs and various uh, committee members, elected officials, whomever, people who rotate a lot, to have a town email address and it's gonna cost $100 per person, there's gotta be a better way. Given the time and what's left on the agenda, I'm gonna bring this back. Um, okay. There's no way it costs $100, so somebody took Just something set it up wrong. as a license. The, I think it's a Microsoft thing. The, ca the county is. announced last week that they are working a deal with Microsoft on a licensing agreement oh, for okay. the county that we'd be able to t tie into. Chris, I think this falls into the IT review. Yeah. Um, before we move forward with that. But I, I, I think in principle it's a great idea and we should all be using email addresses that say town of Harwich. I think you have to do that. I just I did do that. Um, really? So uh, I must admit I have trouble with, the, I try mobile as well. And I can, uh, for I our untechnical board I'm going to bring this back. <laughs> 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 what do you say? What do you say? Our for our untechnical, untechnical board because mine works flawless. I'm just going to throw it out there. But it doesn't I, delete anything and it works great. I was going to say mine works too. But yeah. Okay. Chris? I, the only thing, uh, I guess I'm trying to, this is now the second time we brought this. I, I'm fine with the January 1st, give 90 days. That, that part, I think, makes a lot of sense. Do you want this to be brought back in its existing form and get a better sense for the price? Yes. Yes, because the existing form looks perfect to me. Yeah, I don't have a problem. Go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Can, Can I? Mail. So, okay, so first of all, the money part, yeah, we should look at that, but also, when we do put this into effect, like prior to, how are we going to make sure that all our committee chairs have that email and they understand? Like, are we going to do a little training? Or I, I think originally administration brought it up and we said, you know, we have nothing to compel people to to sign up. And I can't remember what town Yarmouth or somebody had the selectman mandated it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what this gets us to. So I think we need to have a policy that we can then send okay. to each board and committee saying thou shall have. Right. And certainly the liaisons can bring it with them to those meetings. Okay. I was going to say, I was going to make you the mail person. Oh, I don't want to be the mail person. <laughs> <laughs> In charge of electronics. Chris, the policy as written is fine, but let's look at the costs of the... Um, okay. All right, new oh, business. Yeah. Accessory part... Having been on a committee, is this does this apply to the committee members or just the mm -hmm. chair of the committees? Because it lists committees. It says members yeah, of I, the committees. I think that what we're trying to do is that y you can't have deliberations outside of a meeting. So you know, individual members can't communicate outside of a meeting because that's having discussions outside of a, a meeting, and that that's a prohibited practice. So what we would do is assign one to a committee, and whether the committee chair or the um, secretary would, would monitor that so we avoid the issue. Anyone that submits something, it would just go on the agenda, so the chair can put anything on the agenda that needs to be on. So we're trying to prohibit, not prohibit, we're trying to discourage, which I think was a valid concern that was brought up, from having committee members hold deliberations outside of a meeting. So one one per one per committee would be the essentially the answer. All right. So, so the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I, I was just a little because we haven't been doing that, and I'm just curious. Like, yeah, <clears throat> I, that wasn't being done before. Some committees do do that. They they don't realize that it's a violation of the open meeting law, and they'll, you know, somebody will send a group text. I mean, a group email, and yeah. people will reply all. And I've had to jump in a few times on various committees that I'm the liaison and say, stop doing this. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of us didn't know that you couldn't, that have not come from this kind of a government process in the town, don't, didn't know you couldn't do that. Well, right. most, most important is if somebody does a public records request on a wastewater issue, for instance, yeah, uh, they can get into our IT person, can get <coughs> into the wastewater committee's emails, and they can send them all the emails. They won't be subpoenaing your personal computer. Yeah, yeah, all right. Okay, next up under new business is the accessory apartment bylaw. Um, Allie is here tonight, town planner. 
what you have in your packet is a letter dated September 20th. Um, if you all remember, we had a joint meeting with the planning board, and one of the topics that we were going that was a priority to us was the accessory use bylaw. Mm -hmm. Julie, you weren't at the meeting, but asked me to speak. Mm -hmm. um, the planning board met September 20th, and they saw no reason to go forward with this at that meeting. So their question, basically, if I remember correctly, was what's wrong with the existing policy? Charlene um, has has now kind of drafted a what it costs, or actually Allie drafted what it costs currently. Um, but I found it funny that we met with the planning board. We made it a priority. Their first meeting where they discussed it, they didn't make it a priority and they wanted to table it because mm. they saw no uh, reason for change. I, I do think uh, from some discussion with Charlene and, and certainly Allie's here to, to comment that right now if someone wants to have an accessory use, they have to come and uh, submit a plan to uh, planning board and get approval. And I think that going through a, a regulatory process in which they have to go in front of a board, generally people feel more comfortable hiring, having a uh, consultant come in and do that. I think one of the changes that, that we would recommend, I, I think I say this as we, would be uh, have it be administrative. So if it was by right, then they could come in and submit a plan just to the building official, building commissioner. And, you know, I think the, from what I've heard that, you know, some of the planning board members thought, well, we have more control by having it go to the planning board. That's true, but you also increase the cost. Right. And you probably encourage more people to just do it without discourage going through people. the process. So you discourage people from getting voluntary compliance. Mm -hmm. And I think by making a, hopefully a fairly simple change of having it by right and having people just be able to submit it to the building official, Building official is a trained professional, so he's just not going to approve anything. So there will still be a process, but it will be a process that I think will be more consumer-driven and consumer-friendly than going to a uh, board or committee. But it was disappointing that, you know, the selectmen actually we even had a follow-up meeting to make sure that the priorities were valid, and it was confirmed that that was a priority, and then to have them say no <laughs> kind of flies in the face of it. I, I also think it, you know, it goes against what, what we learned at One Cape in trying to regionalize <laughs> these bylaws and, and to try to um, adopt a regional bylaw to increase the housing availabilities to workforce and to the elderly population to be able to, to flip it around if they wanted to and have the accessory be theirs and rent the house to a family. And I think there's so many stipulations in our bylaw that we are totally discouraging it and we're, we're going absolutely against what the commission recommended to us. So I don't understand that. And I would think that the planning board <laughs> would want to move forward and, you know, address those issues. Allie? So uh, the planning board, it was one of their priorities, as you know. Uh, we looked at the housing production plan and took a, a lot of our priorities uh, from there because there were certain recommendations. And one of them was to review the accessory apartment bylaw. Um, and currently, just so the board knows, it's required to be a special permit, which goes through the planning board as a hearing process, things like that. And there's a number of requirements in our bylaw that you have to meet in order to even be able to apply. Um, so the planning board really wanted to look at it again, just to make sure. And we discussed it being a permitted use. That was one of the recommendations in the housing production plan, and it was also one of my recommendations to the board. Um, but after lots of review and thought about this, because they it is one meeting, but they do get the packets about a week before and been thinking about it, I'm sure. Um, their main concern was that they wanted to have the public have a chance to be able to review the applications as a special permit through the hearing process, as well as make sure one of the items is to have it, the accessory apartment be compatible with the neighborhood. And that's what they wanted to make sure they looked as well. So those were their thoughts of why they wanted to keep it as a special permit. They do value the accessory apartment bylaw and they think that it's a great thing um, when one of them comes through. So I just wanted to kind of tell you what the planning board's view was, <laughs> not that they just, you know, had it as a priority, looked at it, and threw it away. They really did put thought into it. But it is, 
I agree that it can be cumbersome <laughs> to have uh, it yeah. as a special permit. And there are some other towns on the Cape, such as Orleans, that does not have it as um, a special permit. So, Allie, there was not, they, they also mentioned in that meeting that they only maybe took five last year, five requests for this? Yeah, there is, the, that's approximately how many there were, yes. And that, to me, seems like, to Amy's point tonight, conservation, they get more applications because the process became easier and it was easier to follow. Mm -hmm. Potentially, So uh, yeah. how many people are doing this without going through the process? Don? Yeah, actually, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was a census worker in 2000. There are a lot of accessory apartments that aren't on our inventory. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just the administrative uh, part of this that's an impediment. I mean, if you look at the requirements in that bylaw, I mean, right. you've got to meet those requirements. You can't mm -hmm. have, like, a, a baby house sitting next to you on the same property. I mean, there's a lot of it. And to Julie's point, we're trying to break through to creating, you know, some sort of rental stock that can, that's yeah. not affordable, but actually is, like, middle class. Right. Uh, and it's the bylaw itself. If they don't consider it a priority, it's the language of the bylaw. It's not just the fees. Right. Um, Julie. So, I mean, part of that bylaw says, you know, if you don't live in this zone, this zone is, you know, this zone, if you live in, you know, uh, get the zone, uh, 40,000 square feet. Watershed I mean, water that's, recharge. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, 40,000 square feet, that's another whole discussion we had at One Cape about, <laughs> you know, how we got to this point of coverage on the Cape is, is that we created this to try to make people spread out, and in a lot of ways, that's created a lot of the impervious surface that we now have. So, I mean, this bylaw, just like everything else, needs to address the issues that we're having. And as a planning board, I would think that they would really want to take a broad look at, at the issues that are plaguing the Cape right now. And they don't, for, it's not for the foreseeable future, it's not going to get better. So we need to do something to make it better. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to point out for the um, water recharge area, I think the reason why it's so many square uh, feet is because it's one uh, bedroom per acre, so that, or right. per 10,000 square, 10, feet. 10, square, square feet, I'm sorry, per acre, yeah. Right. And so it, that's yeah. the reason, but that's because that'd be four. But, but even that, 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 even that zoning needs to be looked at overall in the entire town because we're looking at millennials who don't want to live in a single family home. They want to live in a centralized location where they can go get coffee and whatever. And we don't have that. We, and as a town, in the elderly, the elderly can't leave their houses because what affordable place do they go to? There is nothing affordable for them, yet they don't really want the four bedroom home anymore. Mm -hmm. we, we have this wealth of information at the commission and I find it all very <laughs> realistic because I was rented apartments for nine years. It's all true mm -hmm. and we're not doing anything as a community to address it and we're watching our population age and we're watching our young people leave and we're watching businesses not be able to hire the people they want to because they can't find the housing that they want. Yeah. It's, it's a real issue. Leo? Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I did attend the um, planning board meeting when they discussed the uh, accessory use apartment, and um, I found a couple of things interesting. Um, there is definitely a, a, a division between someone who has a single-family home on a 40,000-square-foot lot and wants to maybe convert the garage to a dwelling or wants to put an addition on the building. There may be certainly a, a facet of residents out there that want to do that. But more importantly, what I think is going under the radar is pre-existing homes right now. In other words, not changing the, the, the structure of the house at all from the outside. Homes that have the capability of having a basement apartment put in or even the house itself divided in half with maybe a couple of doorways installed, interior, interior adding an extra kitchen, um, those are the ones that I really believe that I think Chris has hit the nail on the head that they should be administratively approved because they're not going to impact the, the, the neighborhood. The neighborhood's not going to know that this is going on from the outside. More I think, you know, looking at parking, adequate off-street parking, and when we talk about the environment, the septic system. Now, if you have a pre-existing four-bedroom home right now in the town of Howitch on a 20,000-square-foot lot, it's been there for years, okay? 
a young couple could buy that for a very, very small amount of dollars, turn a one bed, take one of those bedrooms out, maybe one of the other bedrooms out, put, make it a kitchen, and then have a small little living area. And now they, instead of having a four bedroom home, they basically have a three bedroom home. One bedroom that's going to be renting as a um, accessory use apartment, and then maybe they're going to use the other two themselves. That makes that house affordable now to a whole other group of young people and elderly people, quite frankly, that want to move here because now they can make $800 a month on a, a 800 to even 1000 a month mm -hmm. for an apartment such as that. And that's going to make a world of difference for young people being able to afford a home here. As their family grows and they have children, they may decide to take that apartment out and they may decide to use that for their own use. But if we can somehow look at the different kinds of accessory use apartments that not only exist but could exist, I think the law might have to be tweaked a little bit because there's a lot said by pre-existing houses, again, with no exterior change whatsoever, that require those to go in front of a planning board for a special permit is not only cumbersome as far as meeting the law and the requirements, but it's also expensive. Right. I mean, you're looking at, uh, I think it was quoted at that meeting, 500 bucks, 450 bucks just for the application. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't feel comfortable talking in front of people, you're going to, as Chris mentioned, you're going to hire somebody who's going to cost you another 1,000 bucks. And you don't even know if you're going to get the permit. Right. So if we could kind of maybe have a, a difference of pre, I don't want to say pre-existing non-conforming, but pre-existing houses where you're going to be doing your interior work, be something that falls under the administra administration to look at, I, th I think that would be a great plus, and I think you'll find that there are a lot of people in Howard that would step up to the plate and uh, take advantage of that. And being that a lot of towns are looking at this, is the county offering anything with their planners as draft uh, bylaws? or? Uh, I believe the Cape Cod Commission is putting together some draft bylaws, yes, but um, other than that, we, you know, the commission is the one that would handle uh, draft bylaws like that. So, Thank you. Uh, certainly. And, and there's a, excuse me, go. Go ahead, you know. So I have issues with um, the criteria uh, th uh, there's a few here, uh, but H, for instance, the accessory apartment shall be designed so that to the degree reasonably feasible, the appearance of the property remains that of a single family property with matching materials, colors, window styles, and roof design for one structure if the apartment is attached or for both structures if the apartment is detached. What a, no. What if somebody wants something completely different, like a tiny house? everybody's into these tiny houses now and you want you know your grandmother to come live on your property and you want a little tiny house and you want to paint it pink why why should we ha tell anybody that they have to make the accessory apartment look like their house so that's one thing and what was the other thing so let me cut you off all right Chris in order to get our point across that we want to continue to work on this though they don't how do we go about this? Go ahead, Dana. Uh, I would just suggest that you ask the Cape Cod Commission for some um, draft bylaws and, and, and take a look at them. Uh, there's nothing that says that you, the people in control of the warrant, can't submit a warrant article that you ask town meeting to vote on. Okay. Uh, I, I, I comment too that uh, I think it was two weeks ago. Uh, I sent uh, an article in the paper on uh, draft bylaws yes. that was uh, directly towards this. We have maybe we get those people or that group to talk to us in the planning board. Would, would that for us? I also uh, state that uh, we just uh, formed a committee on economic mm -hmm. uh, growth, and uh, I asked that we put it in. The, you know, looking at regulatory, this directly falls into that reason I wanted that statement in there. We need to be looking at these uh, impediments because I can't agree with more. I, I, it really says everything. You know, we need to find something to help out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think if the board, uh, you know, just makes its intent more clear that it expects to see a, a amendment to this uh, accessory use and to have a component be an administrative component and maybe there are cases where it stays as a special permit. I, I think that, you know, you could make that clear and that either administration would work with the planner and do it or the planning board can work with the planner and, and do it. 
but one way or another, it needs to be looked at and it needs to be streamlined. And whether they use the resource of the commission to get some ideas is is perfectly acceptable, I think. Can you work with Allie to get a me that message across to the planning board and then we'll come, they can come before us again and, and uh, I think it's a great idea to ask the uh, commission for uh, mm -hmm. draft bylaws as well. And the commission does have that draft bylaw of an accessory already? apartment. Okay. Yeah, and that's been around since December. But but to Leo's point, maybe they, what, sorry. I, I was thinking that then from that bylaw, there's probably parameters that they could help us with. A absolutely, but I think, and, and pardon me, uh, Mr. Chairman, but um, I think what, what important part is missing in that is the difference between things. Yeah. Everybody's looking at excessive use apartments and they're looking at this model, kind of what you have in front of you, someone who wants to build or additions and all that. And no one, I think, is, has really focused on uh, not only some of them that are pre-existing, because there are quite a few in this town and, and across mm -hmm. the Cape that are pre-existing. I don't want to say they're illegal, but they may not be operating on, with a permit. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly just to have something in a, uh, looking at the existing homes and within the parameters of the interior of the existing home, I don't think anyone's really looked at that yet. So I'm going to call the commission and find okay. out this week if they if they have anything on just on that aspect of it. Oh, okay, great, right. thank you. So it's the consensus of this board to continue to work on it and encourage the planning board to continue to work on it? Yes, okay. definitely. Thank you. Okay, next up, discussion on in-house legal counsel. This was before us. What the budget message? We're going to skip oh, that? Oh, budget message. I knew I was missing. I left my glasses at home. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there we are. So discussion on Board of Selectmen budget message. Uh, last week, staff sent last year's budget message to you. Um, I asked that you send me comments on anything that you wanted in the budget message. Larry did send me some comments. Um, I don't know if that got distributed to everyone, yeah, so I didn't we'll, we'll have I didn't to, either. We'll have to make it. sure it gets distributed, the FY18. 18. 18. Yes. Yeah. So next week, year. we have to vote on that. Okay. So it, it's, uh, and I don't mind writing it again, but I'd like to get your uh, Com comments. Okay. Um, you know, speaking of the budget message, you know, looking at the presentation tonight, and five years out, we're at 71 million. Uh, you know, I think we really need to take a good look at our budget this year and uh, be pretty strict about increases. Um, so please feed me your comments. Our budget looking out is looking bleak. Pretty, pretty bleak. Uh, okay, so if I can get that, Chris, if they can send that out tomorrow. Yes, we'll uh, put that in the package, last year's. All right, discussion of in-house legal counsel. I put three different things in the packet tonight, which was just a collection off the internet. Town of Falmouth's was actually probably the most helpful. But we had this before us, I believe it was in July also. And at the time, I think it was, uh, you know, towards the end of it, we got talking about replacing current council, KP Law and some of the others. This isn't to replace. This might be to do away with some of the work that they do. Um, this would be proposed by me, at least, as a co for cost savings, to take some money out of our legal, but to have an in-house lawyer. Like I said, your, dis your descriptions are in here. But to help with our regulatory boards, to help with writing bylaws, to help with writing laws to help uh, tax collection, um, owners unknown property, but to have somebody in-house to get that basic legal question answered and also put together work to go to KP Law if we have to, uh, if we have to get into a suit, it seems to make sense to me. Janelle? So, uh, Mr. Chair, what you did not include is the salary of Falmouth's attorney Barnstable's attorney. Because the first thing we have to do is agree as a board that we want to go in this direction, okay. and then staff can take a look at what it would cost us. So you're right, because we don't know if it would be a 20-hour-a-week position or a 40-hour-a-week position. 
for what we would want to use it for. I would have to know that information before I would vote on this. I'd need to know what it's going to cost and uh, if it would be a benefited position. So are you saying you support the concept and we would instruct staff to, to look into that information that you're looking for? I'm not saying that. Or do that, I want to keep doing I'm not saying that. <laughs> well, what are you saying? I'm saying, didn't, I think you just said that we would have to decide as a board if we wanted staff to look at this concept. Right. I am not even prepared to say anything about that until I know what the concept really is. This is a concept that says what town council does in other towns. That doesn't mean anything to me. What I want to know is what are they going to do in our town and how much is it going to cost us? So who's going to, are you going to do any of the work on this? No. Okay. <laughs> Don? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <laughs> I stumbled into t a Dennis Town Hall last month for a completely different purpose and went to the administrator's office and I said, well, uh, next door neighbor is their in-house counsel. The one thing that I know, I mean, and this is kind of what I was pitching the last time, is you don't know what you don't know if you don't know it. And if, if we don't at least ask uh, these people what they're doing, we can't make an intelligent decision about uh, re-upping with KP Law. I know Dennis has got a hybrid. That's why they've got KP Law still listed. Um, if they got something tough and they need to refer something uh, on the basis of that case being referred, that's what they do. I also know that Dennis has, forgive me, uh, Dana, Dennis has a reputation of being really stingy with a buck. I mean, <laughs> a, a, their finance committee ha has delivered one, for, for a generation one of the lowest tax rates in the state, not just on the Cape. I can't believe that they would expose themselves to major litigation uh, if this thing didn't work at all. But I can't know that. And I don't think any of us can know that until we ask, how's this working? How much does it cost you? And uh, what's your experience been with it? And that's all I'm interested in seeing. Uh, I'm not interested in voting tonight on, let's have an in-house counsel. Yeah, I, I think, Mr. Chairman, maybe to, to accelerate the discussion a little bit. Uh, th there's three places that are on Cape that, that have uh, in-house counsel, Dennis, Falmouth, and Orleans. Why don't we find out what their arrangement is and just bring that back? I would also point out, I mean, KP Law, you know, is the, the majority of how towns do it, and there's a reason for that. But I think why not have at least the uh, information? Julie? I do think it's important to know the cost because and I, I don't mean this to sound wrong or, you know, but overall what they're getting paid is going to dictate the quality that you're getting. And without knowing that, I don't know that I want, if, if it's going to be a $60,000 a year position plus benefits so that we're up to 75, 80, whatever else, say 100,000, 60,000 is the base pay. We're not going to get a fantastic attorney for that. And then we're going to actually have to use KP as well. So I'm just, I would want to know the cost. Well, we all live with our history. And uh, coming from the corporate world, that's, that's models are my history. We had an in-house lawyer that did the basic stuff and that was cheaper, but we did go out for specialists to do all the other. And that was an overall less expensive than hiring a specialist each time you need a lawyer. And we do have a lot of general uh, discussions, you know, orders of conditions, things like this that we could probably do, especially if they got to know what we're doing. Yeah, you know, I'd like to know the money aspect, but I, I like the idea. I think it's probably a cost savings to do that base first. Thank you. Dana? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I only rise because uh, I was sitting in your chairs when we uh, got rid of our last town council and hired KP. <laughs> so um, I've been through this before. We actually had a six-month span where we had no legal counsel, hmm. and the Board of Selectmen just decided everything, um, <laughs> oh, <God>. including <laughs> telling the state that we weren't going to cap our reef landfill when um, they said that we had to recap <laughs> our landfill. So we made some pretty bold decisions back then. Uh, but we had as close to an in-town council as you could have. We had somebody that lived here locally and, and did our work for us. And um, there was attachments to each article that involved uh, legal counsel that um, included the price of that council. And overall, we found that the cost of keeping that was higher than just hiring KP. So we hired KP because a lot of it to do with um, the, it was a cost savings for us. We were getting a bigger bang for our buck there. So 
You just want to make sure that whatever you're looking at, I like Chris's idea of getting what the other towns are doing and how they have that arrangement. It could be something that saves you money, but it also could be something that if it's not structured properly could get away from you. Thank you. Janelle? So I said I would not work on this at that level, but I would propose that I would um, work on it at a different level. So what I learned over the last year is KP is basically a, co a cooperative. You know, everybody owns a little piece of the, of the firm. So perhaps KP takes on new attorneys right out of law school, and they could be part of our team, and they may be uh, billed at a lesser rate. And that would be a discussion that I would be willing to have with John Giorgio. Leah. Yeah, I'm glad I came tonight. <laughs> um, ironically, I'm going to put on my county commissioner hat for a minute. Um, ironically, I had this discussion with my board and certainly have had this discussion with uh, my administrator or our administrator. And it was included in one of the surveys that the county sent out. Um, I think that this is an area that um, the county should step up. Um, all the communities, almost all the communities on the Cape, except those that you mentioned that have some in-house counsel, use KP. And it, to me, it seemed uh, a cost-effective plan if the county had legal staff and you know had one high-ranking attorney with a couple of interns under them and provided the services directly to the town. I, I, I can't see how it wouldn't be cost-effective um, because I don't know. I just can't see how it wouldn't be cost effective. So I'm hoping you do explore this because I think every town needs to start looking at what we do regionally, what we do so similar, yet we, for some ungodly reason, we want to do it ourselves, and it's kind of crazy. So uh, you guys are already regionally involved in the law firm. It just happens to be a big law firm that's making a lot of money from a lot of the communities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those separate occasions in which um, you're already in the middle of something right now where, where if you sue another town and they're using KP law, they're going to use the, the other communities using it too. So I don't know. This is one of those things that I, I think it's great that you guys are looking into it. And I hope maybe you might send a letter to the county and say, hey, county, why don't you guys look at it too? Because uh, I'm getting a little bit of pushback there. But I, I think it's an area that we can provide this yeah. service to the towns. Uh, Leo, in your idea, is the, are the attorneys that you're speaking of actually county employees, or is it another firm? No, I, I, my idea was to hire a, a full-time uh, county uh, employee uh, as, well, depending, and bring on one first, and then, and then building a department. I actually wanted to create a, a legal department. By the way, you can add in your list that Cape Cod Commission has an in-house attorney, too, by the way. So you might want to add that and contact them because she may not be getting paid exorbitant amount of money, but she's a pretty damn good attorney. So they, they get in the bag for the buck for the person that they have. She's Don. been there for a number of years. Thank you, Leo. Yeah, Don. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to go back to the last meeting and, and talk about, well, you know, one bad lawsuit and we could be paying more. My question is when we do this is it's not just the money. It's like what, is, what do we expect to be happening? And one of the thoughts that I had about in-house counsel, if it was defined as being available in the town, is, and I'm pretty sure that's a dentist model, is uh, the lawsuit that you don't get into is a better lawsuit. Uh, and they're available to the regulatory boards to help them, like, like the Board of Health had a real contentious meeting uh, last week about piggeries. If we had an in-house counsel and we didn't have to actually ask uh, John to come down and sit in as an extra fee, uh, and that was the confines of the in-house counsel, and you went to KP Law for other things, that's why I'm interested in hearing other towns and what their experience is. It's not just just the money. I mean, I, and I understand what Dana just said, except that that was a generation ago. It was 20 years ago. Uh, I was yeah, I know. I had hair, too. Uh, but it, that's the point, is uh, wh what are we getting for that? And that's it's a, the discussion, and I think we shouldn't be afraid to at least explore that because we could always come back to where Janelle is and say, you know what, I still feel we're exposing ourselves too much legally. We should stay at KP Law. And, I, and I'm fine with that if that's what the majority of the board wants to do. I'd really like to do it with some foreknowledge, though, about 
because like Larry said, I had, I had in house counsel for doing the contracts uh, years ago. You only went out if there was some complex uh, you know, issue that you needed an expertise for. Uh, and that's why I would like to hear, how's this working? Who are you paying to do what, and how, how much does it cost you? Thank you, Don. Chris? So, uh, Mr. Chairman, not to prolong this too much, we'll, we'll do the research and get those four. Uh, I do want to just make it clear, maybe I was a little bit too flip. Okay. My last town, I had KP Law, and my board said get rid of them and, and change out. And I actually changed out to a, a, local, a local attorney that didn't have as much overhead, and I had a, a firm that backed, stopped him if there were things that he w didn't know. And it was interesting that I thought we got better quality and we were more cost effective in doing that. So I, I know in my experience, my last job, you know, that we were able to do that. I don't know, I didn't expect to save as much money as we did, but it was. But we did have, just for full disclosure, I mean, there was a few complicated cases that were farmed out to expensive attorneys. So. You know, an in-house counsel is not going to be able to, to cover all. It's too bad in a way. I mean, I thought one guy that has, I have a lot of respect for is Mike, Mike Ford. And, and Mike Ford's a resident of Harwich. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, he, he's he wanted to phase leads. out. But, yeah. it, just, but just so there's no confusion, nobody's recommending that we get rid of KP Law or any of our other attorneys. So the little document that I took the time to go on the Internet and found that says what town council is, mm -hmm. if you actually read that, it says exactly what the questions are. So town council acts as liaison with outside council and consults with outside council as needed on matters requiring special, special expertise. So the information that you're asking is right here. So in-house council, what they do, if you just take the time you read this, it's not to replace KP law. It's simply to add another level of professionalism to the town and to save us what KP Law does charge on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and Don, I'm glad you brought it up. I sat through that Board of Health meeting. I was actually a bit horrified. The, um, the farmers were represented, the property owners were represented, and the town was represented by a, par by, by a voluntary board that was basically outgunned at that point. And we should have had a council, we should have had council at that table that night. And that's one instance. But how much, if you, get, again, go back and read this document, because I did take the time to go get it for you, it's what town council does. And I'm not proposing that we get rid of KP law. That's never been the proposal. With that, Chris said he would get us the numbers. We'll look at the numbers. Uh, next up is goals and objectives assignments. Uh, tonight you have in your packet goals and objectives. Charlene put, uh, I did as I said I was going to do. I put the board member's name. <coughs> next to the ones that they are, um, that I thought they'd be most interested in working on or from what you sent me as your goals and objectives. So on the finance one, uh, objective A through one through four is the whole board because it has to do with town finances. So if anyone has a problem with what their name got put beside something, please let me know. Uh, and we don't have yeah. to decide that tonight, just read through it. Right. Familiar, familiarize yourself again with our goals and objectives and uh, if you want to change something please let me know any discussion on that no mm -mm. treasure chest discussion um, we had a few more complaints about the treasure chest um, one complaint is that there's no minutes online from the last eight months another complaint is people uh, volunteers taking things out of the treasure chest as they come into the parking lot before the residents get them. Uh, Janelle started to look into this uh, as the liaison to the treasure chest committee. I um, put it on the agenda because the full board should be aware of what any board member is doing and does the board have a problem with Janelle diving into this or do we want to instruct Link to dive into this? Don? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Janelle needs to do this, and, and frankly, the problem is the leadership at the, the committee level. I mean, I went online, too, and uh, it's actually three years they haven't had minutes. Okay. They've had seven meetings in three years, and not one of them has had minutes. Uh, my guess is if, if, if they have a greater clarity about what the expectation is, because 
there's the people, they vote for us, then there's a committee that we appoint, and the volunteers uh, probably shouldn't be running it, but I mean, getting into the, those weeds is not the idea. I mean, she's the liaison to the committee that has these volunteers, so if they fix their method of operation, I think everything is going to fall into place, and uh, I have faith that she can do that. Larry? Thank you. Well, uh, you know, I obviously agree with that. I'm a little disappointed because I did meet with them. I was liaison for a very short time and asked them to uh, uh, complete the uh, ethics course. Uh, I thought I had convinced them they should complete that by the end of the month. <laughs> We're coming close. Yeah, don't laugh. You. It's not <laughs> no, I'm just saying it's not easy <laughs> to do. I get it. And uh, their, com their concern was of having uh, uh, PCs available to do that online. Uh, I talked to Chris. I talked to Foster. Got back and said, you know, that we will arrange that for them. Uh, I, and so I've had these discussions. So I, I can only say I'll support, you know, going forward. I think the board needs to support that. But there's... Uh, uh, and I'm, I'll be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it done. Julie, <laughs> anything? <laughs> no, I, I, have, <laughs> I have faith in Janelle and Larry. <laughs> uh, you know, one, one complaint that Sorry, I got I didn't mean to leave you was pe people <laughs> taking things out of people's car that are not actually donating. You know, they pull in, they open up, they take something out, the committee volunteers go over and take the rest of the stuff out of the car. <laughs> and then they have to tell them to put it back. So it, it really, I think, is beyond oh, need, yeah. um, funny at this point. And I think Chris, uh, yeah. maybe with the department head, if the, if the department head's involved, Janelle, please see Chris. Other yeah, than that. that's what I was going to say. It, se it seems that um, the, I emailed Link and Chris to find out exactly how, what the mechanism is. And Link is in charge of the volunteers. We are in charge of the committee. And there's no rhyme or reason in the way that I read it who's in charge of the actual treasure chest. Um, so I think I would like to have a meeting, if you don't mind, Chris, sure. with you and Link and sure. maybe the chair of the committee, the four sure. of us. Yep. They haven't organized in years. Well, the chair, well, whoever's acting as chair, I believe his name's Eric. Yeah, they do have an acting chair. And yeah. You no, know, he's trying to add. He was I away. He was, you know, he's trying to put structure into it, but it's a tough, uh, tough committee. But we could set something up. Okay. Thank you. Leo, Thank you. I'm glad you came tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think, I think what uh, Selectman Brown just said is hit the nail on the head. You guys need to get a handle on this. You can't expect these volunteers to put together uh, policies and procedures, okay? This it has to come from this board. Um, you know, you can certainly work it out with your committee and, and take their suggestions, but there should be a written policy and procedure on the operation down there. And, and they need to clearly know that, you know, you guys are their bosses. I mean, that's just the way it works. That's the way the tree falls. The only other thing I just want to mention for public record and for not only this committee, for others in your town, but I'm trying to call up, uh, October 2nd in Mashpee, uh, there's an open meeting law uh, seminar being put on by the state. And I would highly suggest it. And if, Chris, you don't have it, I'll be happy to try to forward you the yeah, link to it. But the state's putting it on. And I would highly suggest that you uh, uh, insist that your um, committee members attend so they learn how to run a meeting and agenda a meeting properly and, um, and take minutes. Minutes aren't a big deal. I mean, all they are is you know, the motions. Say, they don't have to be... Uh, they don't have October to be. Uh, second. Yes. It's, a it's a Monday. It's a Monday. That's a it's a Monday. I believe it's. That's uh, a board meeting night, though, for us. Unless it's. Well, you guys don't have to go. You guys run a pretty good open meeting. Uh, <laughs> five to it's next nine. Monday. Thank you, Leo. <laughs> you just say next five to eight. I'm sorry. Five to eight. Five to eight. And, and it's, it's at Mashpee Town Mashby. Hall. No, I don't know. I don't have it in my book where it's at. But I'll I'll find it and send it to Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Town administrator's report. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll make this uh, just kind of quickly go through a few things here. I just saw in the uh, update on the vote of the Cape Tech School, uh, Cape Cod Tech School, I just want to make sure, you know, people know it's uh, October 24th from noon to 8. <clears throat> there will be two ballots. The, the ballots will be two different colors. When you go into the ballot booth, you will be presented with, uh, you'll have to check in and check in to get ballots from two check-ins and then check out with two check-outs. Uh, so there's a two sets of uh, poll workers. 
uh, but one ballot will be uh, basically done by the uh, Cape Cod Tech School uh, that will determine whether the project goes forward and the second ballot will be a town ballot that will determine how it's going to be paid for through a, uh, a debt exclusion. So there are two ballots that are both relative to the same topic, uh, but one for the uh, project itself and the second how the town of Harwich would actually pay for it. And then you will feed both ballots so the machine's able to differentiate between the two so it can tabulate the two. So that won't be a problem for the uh, machine, but I guess through election law we have to have the two sets of uh, check-in workers and the two sets of checkout workers. The other uh, item I had, I, I did uh, have in the correspondence package for the board. I, I did go over and meet with the uh, pastor from the First Congregation Church, uh, and maybe just to uh, make sure that that's clear, I, I thought, it, number one, it was a, a very good meeting. I had some discussion in which, uh, in accordance with the court decision, that they do want to make sure they protect the uh, unmarked graves underneath the, um, the, the, um, the urns that are, that are there now. Uh, so they will uh, take a map and agree on a map as to where the unmarked graves are. So when they do the internments of the um, urns, I know there's a different name for it, but it's not coming to me. Uh, they'll make sure they do it outside of that area so it doesn't continue that practice. And I, I did relay to them that um, basically in the decision, it made it pretty clear uh, that when the town assumed that we own the property, we did the maintenance. Now that, that we do not own the property and, and it has been determined that we do not own it, the only other mechanism for us to go in and do maintenance on that property would be if, if the church was derelict and didn't have the ability to take care of the graves. Uh, obviously they do. So uh, I did give them uh, kind of a notice that as of uh, October 31st, give them a little transition time uh, to, to make arrangements. So. Uh, I just at least wanted to report the, uh, the the results of that discussion. I don't think any additional action will come out of that. I think that was consistent with what the board was looking for uh, in, in terms of it. <clears throat> and then I, I have been, uh, we, we have a fair amount of material that's come in in terms of the capital budget. I will uh, put together a memo hopefully in the next day or two on the, uh, the summary of the capital budget items and then the um, Capital Outlay Committee does have four meetings that they have scheduled to do presentations, so we'll schedule those out. I don't know who the liaison is to the uh, Capital Outlay Committee, but we'll just provide all that material directly to the, uh, to the board members. Uh, and that concludes my, uh, yes, yes, that concludes my comments this evening. Don. I don't want to have a sleepover here, so uh, <laughs> just to, uh, to ask, I mean, maybe we could do this uh, uh, another meeting, but uh, it, uh, your memo suggests that all churches that were involved with the town mowing w would fall in that category, but uh, we also said a few weeks ago that there were perpetual funds. I'm unclear about that. I thought they were handed over to us years ago, and if that's the case, I'm not sure what the definition of perpetual is. Uh, so maybe we could talk about that in another agenda item in the, fu in the future? Sure. Okay, Selectman's Report. Discussion of format for budget se uh, sessions tentatively scheduled for February 10th. Chris, do we, want, we don't need to dive into this. Is February 10th okay? I, I think the big question is Saturday or no Saturday. Um, if people want to do a couple nights and we'll add to the agenda a couple nights and then break up the departments, I thought that's kind of what I got from the sense of the board. Or if you if you're love the Saturday session, we just need to start to organize what we want to do. So I guess really the ultimate question is Saturdays or do you want to have evening meetings? And then we need to coordinate with FinCom. I was comfortable with, with Saturday when we did it before. We got it done in one day. Do you know? Well, we get lunch on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> pretty soon we're going to have a room tonight. Uh, Saturday? <laughs> it's fine. I'll go with Saturday. I already saw you. So I'm going to go. Julie's a no vote, but she can come. I know. Uh, go nice, uh, but Chris, whatever. The one thing I will say is, is last year the the larger departments were rushed through it, and then the smaller departments, I almost think we could do in a night. So maybe we could just look at the format. But the first half of the day, I know we kind of crammed mm -hmm. a whole bunch of big departments in, mm -hmm. and then in the afternoon we kind of flew through everything, and we were waiting. So See, that's the problem. Is you start to lose. It's like it's a lot of information in your. So let's do one evening and a Saturday. 
<laughs> we could do, I mean, potentially we could do that, do the bigger meeting. I thought the finance committee liked the Saturday of the joint meeting as well, but um, then it cost Thank you. Finance committee. Uh, yes, we did um, prefer that um, in the last votes we've taken on it, our discussions we've had. We've done it both ways. We've done it the nights. We've done it, you know, and that tends to be quite a few nights when you start. You can only do one or two departments a night. Um, that ends up being quite a few nights, but you can take a night and buzz through all the small ones if you want to. I might have um, voted for nights until tonight because I thought we were going to be home by 8.30. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I told my sitter. So. You, you can, those can tend to be long nights as well. Uh, but yeah. looking at the format and having it on Saturday worked for us. Okay. Chris, I'd say Saturday. Let's just discuss the layout. Okay. Uh, what else was left? Anything else on the selectman's report? There was something about the budget. Can I mention one thing? Budget warrant timeline. I think uh, just to it's prelude, the uh, October 2nd meeting uh, is a joint meeting with FinCom, and then the uh, folks from Monomoy will be here to talk about uh, the enrollment components. Okay. So, um, And then the committee vacancy list, we didn't post it this week. Let's make sure <coughs> we post it next week. And uh, It's in the packet. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, it is yeah. Yeah. Wastewater, it wastewater it was is. wrong. We need yeah. Comscom yeah. members. Um, Don and I are having a interview meeting Wednesday. on Wednesday, so the committee list will change. Okay. okay. Selectman's report, Larry? Uh, none. Julie? Um, I'm just going to mention this, but I'll bring it back later because it's too in-depth. Uh, I met with the Utilities and Energy Committee, and they had an interesting presentation um, by Seth Pickering about green communities, and I guess we've discussed it in the past, but it's interesting t that we look at this again, I think, so. Put it in the packet last yeah. week. Yeah. Same evening. Janelle? I'm all set. Pardon? I'm all set. Done. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. If folks could